unfortunately, we haven't learned how to code ourselves. Everybody yeah. else knows how to. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're, 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 they know how to help, how to utilize us for their algorithms. And when I, and that's for society, not just our mm. culture. Because I feel like we use the word culture a lot, but it's really society at this point. Mm. Right? Like, I feel like we isolate ourselves from societal problems, mm. even though society is dealing with the same exact problems. So it's in a <laughs> yeah, different yeah, way. Yeah. So it's like when we talk They're about scaled. Like male and female dynamics as if that's only happening in black culture, it's not true. It's mm. happening in society. When we talk about the effeminization of males, that's not just happening in black culture, that's happening mm. in society. Right. Right. This is why you you get this new manosphere that pops up. And people always demonize this manosphere, but you gotta look at what created the necessity for it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. What you, environment. You, you yeah. can never talk about the branch of something without getting to the root of mm -hmm. it. Right? Mm -hmm. Why are these young men feeling so disempowered? Right. It's not just because women are being empowered. That's not. It's, it's just not some natural progression that this has happened, mm -hmm. right? It, it's because of the camp, and and also this is why we get back to capitalism. Capitalism controls and has a greater degree of influence over these new social realities mm -hmm. than any activist ever. Peace family, is 19 Keys. Welcome to another episode of High Level Conversations. A place where we like to dive deep into the mind, society, the fabrics of philosophy, existentialism, metaphysics, culture, and really just about any topic that interests the mind that will allow us to grow. Today, I brought somebody here that is a polymath, one whose interests and mindset range in multiple areas, who isolates himself so that he can learn what the masses don't know and put it into application. And he has made a life of this. Some would say he's nomadic, but he has the skill sets that allow him to be able to corporatize his interests, create a business around it, and to be able to hack reality in the ways that the average person only wish. The conversations I have with this brother offline or what gave me the idea to bring them online. Conversations such as about technology, coding, hacking, the mind, theories, philosophies, psychology of society, and more. He's that one friend, right, that you can talk to about the deep thoughts and it's just a normal conversation. Because it's not that deep when you high level. Today, I have none other than one of the tech architects in the culture that is Mr. Human. Take peace, brother. Time. Peace. Hey, I appreciate you, first yes, off, <laughs> for having me on. You know, it's been a long time coming. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a very long time. Uh, we talked about this for a while. So I want to go ahead and just dive right into it. You know. Yeah, that introduction, Yeah, most definitely. You got to chef up for the people. There's a lot of interesting things going on today. One of the things that a person can consider to be, you know, um, I would say alien in a way, right, is the self-replicating or self-healing and replicating robots, right? And me and you was having this conversation based on the scientific, you know, um, experiments that are being done right now and that are actually being used, right? And... I think about the future a lot because I don't want to have future shock. I don't want to have disorientation and anxiety about things to come. So I know that if I think about them, that it eases the tension between where we are and where we're going, right? And then it prepares me to have, you know, influence and control over my own future, right? Now, I want you to kind of give me a breakdown, you know, the same way we did off camera you know, to the people about these nano robots and where this idea came from. Yeah, so um, they're called xenobots, right? And they can grow, communicate uh, using stem cells and the same communication networks that our neurons use, gap junctions, uh, bioelectricity, et cetera. And it was developed by, obviously, like any great project, 
a number of scientists, but one of them being Michael Levin. And he's a, a microbiologist who studied this process that happens in planarian worms. And basically what he observed is that essentially every cell in any life form is just as intelligent as a human brain. Right? So we assign intelligence and to, to our mind, we localize it to our mind, and maybe that's just because where, it's where we perceive from, in large part, we hear from here, we see from here. But his study goes into the fact that every cell is just as intelligent. They all communicate. They can all break down a virus, decode, and you know, embed that into DNA, those algorithms to handle them later. So as he was studying the planarian worms, he was you know, cutting off parts, watching them grow back. It's a natural process for them. But every time they grew back, he was um, using a specific type of microscope. I think it's an electroscopy microscope where you can see like bioelectric fields. And he noticed that the shape of whether it was the head or the tail was still there. And through study of like basic inputs and out output signals, so, you know, treating the body like it's a, a regular machine. If you stimulate this, you get this response. If you tickle this, this will happen. And he was able to see what lights went on when the organism was regenerating its head. Uh, but what he also noticed was that the field was always there, as in this invisible electromagnetic field that um, represented the head or the face. So through studying that almost analog, that's the term you used when we spoke on it the other day, um, studying that analog process and that approach towards biology, to be able to, he's been able to not only implement it into the xenobots, but also we're looking at cellular regeneration for ourselves and you know people with lost limbs, etc. And then you were saying because the, the way that he's looking at it is like, you know, um, almost like call and response. Like one thing, one input gets another output, and once you start looking at it like that, that's how you start seeing human beings that we can be broken down in these processes and the brain is not seen as the whole, right? Like, I'm a human being with emotions, feelings, consciousness, it's saying it. No, the brain has a particular part that can be broken down and your neurons, we go deep inside and we see that if we stimulate this area, it will cause this behavior, right? So now you're not seeing the human being as whole, you're seeing them as processes. Right. And so this is this is it's interesting because this is what most scientists right start to see reality as they don't see the human being. They see these processes that they can tinker with. Right. And this is kind of where you kind of go into get like the mad scientists that want to take over the world. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it's like, you know, you may see yourself as this whole thing, but I know that this is ex this expression is only a part of these little processes. And if I tinker with this, then that's kind of where you get like, you know, social manipulation and social psychology and, and psychologists understanding the mind and, you know, playing that out on a larger scale of society, right? And this is kind of where we at today of like, human beings have been tinkered with so much throughout time, right? Yeah. To the point where social engineering, to the point where the way society moves has been greatly influenced by what corporations are deciding to push, right? And that the idea that we're somehow in control of society versus corporations are in control of that and they decide to say, hey, I think that we'll push this because we want to control spending power. Right. So if people, let's say if if men want to wear, I, I seen a, a study where they were saying that 15 percent of men uh, wear makeup now. Right. And 17 percent are thinking about it. Right. So corporation will say, OK, hey, we just got this data. This is a new trend. Right. Or whether they created it or not. They say this is a new trend. So how about we now start pushing ideas. Right. To take that 17 percent that's thinking about it, convert them over. Right. And then let's hire influencers. Let's put money behind it. Millions and billions of dollars, because if we invest that into this societal change, we have a new pool of customers. And now we have 
we now we can take advantage of this new spending power. So they're what they're doing when you think that it's about your freedoms, your expressions, these new norms that post a fight, you know, patriarchy and things of that nature, but it's more so just, you know, corporate agenda to influence spending power so they can get consumers to buy new products. Right? And so this is where you have to take a look back and be like, no, most of what we think is progress, or not, I would say we, but I would dare say what society is thinking is progress, it's just corporate agenda. Yeah, yeah. The the uh, corporate influence on, on politics, because there's businesses with more money than entire countries, right? So when they set up shop in that country, who has control? Uh, but yeah, you remind me, uh, you, you touch on Edward Bernays a lot, mm -hmm. and I studied his work as well. One of the things that are interesting is that he was Sigmund Freud's nephew, right? So he grew up pretty much understanding psychology, ego, and ID, and being noticing that the smallest subconscious, um, smallest subconscious things had huge implications in, in a person's woke, awakened consciousness, pardon me. That being said, when you, when you speak on systems, and I think everything's a system, right? Um, like you said, the body, we have the digestive system, respiratory system, nervous system. Uh, out in our environment, we have the ecosystem. Uh, we have a solar system. All of these different systems. And with each of them, you can tweak something small, and in your body, you can end up with a disease that's caused by a poor eating habit, allergy, things like that. Uh, so the nature of understanding systems is pertinent to as you were explaining, reverse engineering and getting your own goals, sometimes terraforming the environment by that understanding, changing society. Um, the last episode you did, I believe it was the last one, if not the one before, about cloning. Incredible. What methods were they using to clone? Are they using a clone currently? It's that social engineering, you know, understanding the psych psychology what we want because we kind of all respond like Pavlov's dogs. When this bell goes off, we do this. And I mean, they have the, the data on it by the number of surveys. We have the, the history of market and consumerism. So at this point, anybody who isn't, you know, hasn't come into that full self-awareness and knowledge of self is pretty much being puppeteered. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the. It, it, when when you when you get to this level where you're studying animals, you know replication systems, and then creating robots based on that same system. Yeah. And and here's the thing: it's like transhumanism is a very real thing, you know. And the generations to come will have a hard time not seeing that as normal, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the reality that we live in now. This is mm -hmm. the new normal, right? Like robots are everywhere, you know. Right. Now, I don't know if the robots that I see in LA are actually delivering food, or if it's part Crazy. of a program just to normalize seeing the robots. Mm -hmm. So when they do want to roll out the business, <laughs> right, it's already normal in your mind. Yeah, yeah. I don't know too many people that have actually gotten any robot delivered food, but right. I always see them going up and down. Yeah. So I feel like it's just a social programming, like you know, experiment to just normalize it. Because right. now I just be sitting at the corner, all of a sudden a robot would just be willing <laughs> past you. Right. And it's like, this is wild. We literally got robots delivering food, and what that represents is taking another job. Yeah, right? Yeah. Because now everybody, you know, is in this fast paced automation age, mm -hmm. right? The age of automation is here. Right. And everybody has to figure out how to implement automation into their business, how to be, you know, AI literate, right? Mm -hmm. If you will. And and most people not going to get to that point of like knowing what deep learning or machine learning is and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Those are the programmers of society, right? right? But the average person should have a high level understanding of you know this new age of development that's happening, and, yeah. it's, and it's sad because you know most of society is just like we just kind of like discard to say that they're never going to be intelligent. So mm -hmm. you know. Y'all don't need to know about this. Let, just, <laughs> let everybody else handle this and hope we're doing something right for you. Right, right. And that's sad because 
When you think about leading the people, when you think about informing the people, you realize informing the crowd is useless, mm -hmm. right? Because they don't really care. Mm -hmm. No, the crowd wants the people that are informing them either to be honest and hope that they're honest, or even if they're not honest, make them feel good about what you're telling them mm -hmm. so that they can continue to live in this bubble of comfort, right? right? right. But outside that, you know, when we talk about the programmers of society, those are the ones who fabricate the illusion that, you know, everybody believes. Right, right. We've seen, and in, in we are in the age of the alien invasion, right? <laughs> Aliens are taking over, whether, you know, and, and this is like going into 2024, you know, things being alien to us is going to have to be such a new feeling that people get used to. Yeah. Right? Like when the when the Mexican government can come out with these two feet aliens that look like little MIB coffee mug, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The little right. <laughs> extraterrestrials. And that's yeah. a normal day. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like you gotta see that <laughs> what's being normalized and what's being pushed on us is that the accepting of everything. Mm -hmm. And that's such a dangerous place that you get to because it's like people talk about the new world order, it's like do you really care? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, when when everything that, from when I was a child, that was once, you know, whispered as a conspiracy, is now just the next real or news clip that I see on TV. Yeah. Growing up with the Scientific American and Popular Mechanics, I would study technology when I was younger. I was so interested and always interested on what's the new technology that's right. part of my programming to like innovation to like new to like mm -hmm. advancement right i would watch the sci-fi channel right. you know i would see watch twilight zone i would i would always be interested in these things mm -hmm. right we were programmed early on to see terminator and robocop mm -hmm. and you know watch the the the, the show artificial uh, with the kid the artificial intelligence ai mm -hmm. we've been indoctrinated for robotics artificial intelligence our whole entire life yeah so when you are have been indoctrinated you know not only that for alien invasion right mm -hmm. your whole entire life when it happens <laughs> what does it feel <laughs> like yeah nothing i know what you mean right? right so you have to think about society and where we at it's like is somebody playing the game mm -hmm. of creating or or ushering in that reality by first getting it to a point where you know um you're getting people's permission by programming them with the idea first so that right. there's no resistance by the time you're ready to roll it out. Yeah, it's that uh, desensitization, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like you're saying, like the whole system doesn't have to know everything. It's the people who, who are projecting with 20-year plans. Yeah. Most people don't have a two-year plan, five-year plan. That's a super fact. Right? So these are people who are looking, thinking about their families, what land their families, generations mm -hmm. to come are going to have. Um, one of the dopest part about the uh, parts about the most recent Matrix was the the architect in that movie, whatever his name was, he said they don't want to break out. You know, mm. they want to be here. Um, so like you're saying, to inform everybody is pointless because how many people do we try to teach every day who really don't want to hear it? You know, mm -hmm. they'd rather be entertained than have to learn something applicable. But the more that I I think about that, it makes me realize, you know, think biologically my my hair cells shouldn't really know what my eyeball cells are doing right they have mm -hmm. different jobs and functions they're not all uh, you know priorities for me to sustain myself so there's this hierarchy in in every system mm -hmm. where okay this is the head and this um, the rest are delegates to to fill in the gaps you know um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely it's, it's a part of that whole systemic process. People focus a lot on nutrition, body-wise. You know, I'm gonna feed this particular system of the body, I'm gonna feed that system. Very rarely do people speak about the mind. Very rarely do speak of, people speak about the brain. The brain needs the most energy, right? The brain is uh, needed to process. The brain is needed to, you know, compartmentalize. The brain is needed for so many things, you know, but we don't know what brain food looks like, you know? We know that the body's electrical, and what I understand about gold is not only is it super conductive, but it's non-corrosive, and it's a noble element. So they say that if I am what I eat, I want to be noble. You know what I'm saying? I want to be 
of the highest degree. And I also want to focus on mental health. I want to focus on gut health. I want to focus on energy. I want to focus on youth. I want to focus on, uh, you know, accessing uh, pineal activity, hormonal balance. Everything the goal represents is what I want to see more of. So what better thing to do but align myself with this particular product and get it out to as many people as I can by singing the praise of gold, which is something that our people have been doing for over 10,000 years. Apple has spatial reality, mm. right? They come and, you know, with the new phones they have now, like, you know, the spatial cameras, mm. right? So that basically, you know, the cameras act like your eyes, mm. right? So the lenses are set up the same way your eyes are. Mm. And they have, you know, um, the same amount of, I, I guess, like filters as the actual eyeballs, right? Mm. So... Mm you're not going to be able to really differentiate, right, reality, right, from this virtual reality Something that shot. you're going to experience. Yeah. And the overlay of adding in the spatial reality into normal reality, you know, it's going to go from these huge headphones, right, into regular just, you know, glasses that people mm. can use. Um, and then eventually, I believe, just go away from phones, period, you know, where, you know, there's already adventures that used to work for, you know, um, uh, AI, open AI, I believe he was the one, I think he the open for, and I think he worked for Apple. He created the phone that can just be, you kind of set it right here and right. then it shows up in your palm. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And I mean, what is that besides kind of like programming people to be deeply interconnected with their technological devices, mm -hmm. right? And this is interesting as well because we see the so-called billionaires and the leaders of, you know, the tech wars meeting together saying, let's put a halt on AI. Right. Do we believe that that's real? Right? Because it's, right. it's one of those things where you're saying, listen, we're going to invent the bomb and then have a discussion about not using it. Mm -hmm. You can't yeah. uninvent it once it's here. Right. right? And I feel like that's a dog and pony show for the people, but it's not a reality. And even though it could be in the sense that they're constantly creating things that, you know, human beings are, we talked about, they so, human beings are so smart mm. that, and we're very smart and too smart for our own good sometimes. <laughs> right. We're so smart that we have to believe that there's someone out there smarter than us. Mm -hmm. Because it's kind of like when you watch Dragon Ball Z. And Goku was so always looking yeah. for a new opponent to fight. Right, so we right. kind of like looking for a <laughs> Dr. Wesley coin to turn super terrestrials yeah. that are smarter than us. So that, you know, gives us a, a new contender, a competitor for our intelligence. Like mm. we're, we're always trying to think beyond our capability. And that's what gives us a point of evolution, not from a physical, but from a conscious standpoint. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like... Mm. Are we smart enough to know what's good for us and what's bad for us? Are we going down an ultimate rabbit hole of self-destruction because we don't see any other point of existence? Right. And I say we as a collective, but even though there's a small amount of people actually in those positions to make those actual decisions. Mm -hmm. now that, that's a brilliant question because I, I was actually reading earlier about how we have prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, right? The ones that work independently, the eukaryotic, they're a group of cells. They're a mm -hmm. multicellular cell. And biologists say that that was the turning point for evolution, you know, based on, depending on what you believe about evolution. Uh, I believe we were made, or, you know, helped make ourselves. But whether we did it by you, means of evolution. You said that, so you don't believe in Darwin's theory I was watching Planet of the Apes just yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So do you believe we come from apes? No. Okay. No, nah, it's, it's impossible. But uh, Why you say that? Because uh, things don't evolve into something else. Mm. You know, so they... We, we have... I'd say the difference between us and monkeys and DNA, they say, is probably the difference between us and Neanderthals, they say. Now... 
they have a, a troglodyte monkey as well, and they had the the multiple humanoid types troglodyte that they say. Nigger, that's what they call them. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hard R, right? That was the full name, right? Troglodyte nigger. Yeah. But no, you know. N-I-G-E-R, but yeah. You, you're not going to get something out of something else. What we see in evolution is more so that what's already there organizes themselves to become large organisms, right? So, and we can see this on any scale, from atoms to you know, molecules, right? To, and then from molecules to basic life forms, up until organs and, and then organisms. And again, we're back to systems. It's like that's the reoccur reoccurring theme. So, point being, organization of information increases the aptitude of a, of a being or entity. Mm -hmm. Cooperation is everything. No cell could do it by themselves. Um, so yeah, so I, I don't believe in evolution. I forgot where I was before, before we well, paused we're talking on about, the... Uh, you know, um, you know, uh, the, the... Oh, the, if the we AI. know what's good for yeah. us. So yeah, to, to that point, there's behaviors that all organisms have that they're programmed with. Right, and as biological beings, we have some of those basic instructions. We need to eat, we need to breathe, um, we take care of our basic needs. So, but anything outside of that, when we develop goals based on our intentions, our wants or desires that you know have nothing to do with survival, we call it you know goal directed behavior, and that's where they assign a consciousness to a being or mm -hmm. soul, regardless of how complex, right? But uh, the goal-directed behavior says that all organisms terraform their environment based on their desires, not their needs for survival. So, for instance, the way we have AC in every household, the way we have paved roads, all of these things that we've done to terraform the planet to make it more convenient for us, not necessarily because it's, it's right. Mm -hmm. We notice that we're destroying the planet as we terraform it. So... You know, we don't always know what's good for us uh, naturally because nature has a blueprint and that I feel nature gives things time to fall into place. Whereas it's not a bad thing, but we rush, we test, we simulate. It's a simulation in a sense. So that, that's just the edge that it has on us. You know? Yeah, I feel like, I mean, you know, I don't believe in Darwin's theory. I'm not a no. Darwinist at all no. um, because I, I know we don't come from monkeys. We don't see enough mutations. No, you know what it, I mean? it, it doesn't make no sense. I, I know specifically melanated people don't come from monkeys. <laughs> you know, um, no. And, and I think that, that that robs us of real history for me, mm -hmm. right? Real history of looking at this planet Earth. Well, people don't understand that there are many different variations to the story of, you know, the beginning of the human race, if mm -hmm. you will, right? There are many different pathways of different types of people, all these different score types. Of course, they're always dark, melanated people, mm. right? But, you know, as they say, you've never seen a black caveman, mm. right? Those things didn't exist, right? Mm. But there were different variations of different type of human beings, right. right? That we have all these different names for. And then you go back further, hundreds of thousands of years or thousands of years, and things that don't make sense with the timeline of what we're told, society's having this deep mathematical intelligence, right? Being able to map star systems, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, creating ceremonial burial systems and things of that nature that directly tell a story of consciousness and the people having like rites and rituals mm. before it was said to be brought out, right, in the mm. human being. Right. So it's like these things that you know, because it's not a enough data and evidence for the scientific community to conclude this to be mm -hmm. a fact, then it's disregarded in the story of human beings. Right. Right. And and it, and it's one of those things like science. You know, can be uh, science is a religion. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A lot of scientists don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. Right. Scientists a lot of times they believe in theories. Right. Mm -hmm. And theories are not things that are proved. Right, 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 and that's the thing about science. Science is not about proving things per right. se, right? It's, it's really about the best theory into superior knowledge 
right, decides that this one expires and there's a superior knowledge that comes in place. Mm -hmm. I was talking to my little brother uh, about this other day about um, mathematics and belief, mm -hmm. right, which are like two of the strongest thought processes because mathematics doesn't require belief and belief doesn't require mathematics. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so it's like people that know mathematics don't need to listen to the people that just believe things. So mm -hmm. it's like the scientists operate off math, right? right? right. Most of the time, because that's how they, you know, uh, uh, can decide whether this particular theory is conclusive or not by mm -hmm. testing the math. Yeah, yeah. Right, but they, they don't have, have proofs. Right, proofs, you know. What I mean? So they're not yeah. operating off a belief system, mm -hmm. right? It's a mathematic system, but math is. Math is like, you know, something you discover. It's not right. something you create, mm -hmm. right? You can formulate new ways to use that math. Like mm -hmm. today's school children don't solve math problems the way we did, yeah, right? Yeah, they yeah, have yeah. much better systems that make it much easier. Right. And children of today that become adults think that they're not good at math, but yeah. teachers weren't good at teaching it yeah, in a way yeah. that simplified the process, mm -hmm. right? So you may be insecure, but... Anyway, back to the point, math is a discovery. When you yeah. discover certain mathematical equations, now you can unlock different aspects of the universe. Right. Right? Alchemy, chemical processes, inventions, yeah. cell phone, quantum entanglement. Yeah. Right? All these things become possible. And so thinking in mathematical terms, right, is different for a society, one that thinks in belief-based terms. Right. Right? Or ones that think based on feelings. Yeah. Right, so it's like that idea of like you know math and belief. I, I find it so deeply interesting because it's more so like a philosophical conundrum. Mm -hmm. Which one is more powerful, mm. right? Math or belief? It's funny because it ties into that thing you were talking about with ignorance and confidence. Mm. Because there's a number of things that if you need to, if you need to know how it will work. Mm. You may never try mm. because you really can't see that far into the future. You may not have the whole plan um, mapped out, but you can believe that you can do it. Right. Um, it just has to be validated. The right. process, that's when you start finding the, the math for it. But you're right as far as math being the formula to, to inter interact with the universe because it's the universe's expressive language. It's the Fibonacci sequence. It's yeah. The, it's yeah. the sacred geometry of the universe. Yeah. Right? Like... It, everything God, can be expressed if, mathematically. If, if one wanted to say God is a mathematician, mm -hmm. right? That's that's his signature. That's his tool because a flower is mathematical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. And when you see, and and, and this is where you get um, like like deformations. Like so, if radiation hit the flower, it throws off the math. Right. Yeah. Right. Color so now changes. that perfect spiral. It's not continuing to go based on that sequence. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so it's like God's, like, when well, you can tell God is involved in something because it's mathematical, yeah. which also states that it's logical. Yeah. So it's a system of logic. That's his logistical chain, mm -hmm. right? And and that's his blueprint all everywhere. Yeah, yeah. It's this spiral. And they was just, scientists were just saying how they found, like, these deep spirals in, like, consciousness that mm -hmm. they don't yet understand. The same spirals we see on the head. The same right. spirals we see in the universe. The same Finger spirals prints. we see in flowers and things yeah. of that nature. But... It, but it gets to this point where it's like, number one, we don't have a society that is very math efficient, mm -hmm. right? Math requires isolation a lot because you have that time to think, mm -hmm. right? So math, this natural process of intuitive calculation that we go through, right? Women have a greater intuition yeah, yeah. than men because they have this connection right through their womb to the universe to where they can calculate things from a subconscious standpoint and get information. Yeah. But that doesn't mean they can show you the work. Right, intuition right, right, doesn't yeah. mean I can show you the work, how I arrived to it. Yeah. But my mind is connected to the answer. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And so I'm listening to the that whisper in my mind that said, hey, this is that, that is this. Mm -hmm. Right? And though and then it becomes a belief. Right. Right? After the calculations. But intuition is to me like subconscious calculation right. beyond conscious understanding. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. but it requires belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like right. it requires you to believe something that 
you can't even prove, mm -hmm. but then you have this knowing about it. Yeah, exactly. Because to you, the fact that you have the feeling is evidence enough that it's real. Right. Yeah, it's almost like belief. Not for everybody, but belief being the the knowing without the math, yeah. without the proof. Yeah, one could and, say. You know, it's, I, it's I grew probably up. like the intersection of math and belief mm -hmm. is, is intuition because they both require intuition requires mathematics. It's yeah. calculation for sure. Yeah, and then you have to have faith and belief in your intuition to follow it. Right, and it's funny because like the heart, they say the heart has its own nervous system, mm -hmm. right? And it's an oscillator. Yeah. It's beating constantly and it's sending out waves all the time. Mm -hmm. And when you look at how radars work, that wave that encounters, let's say, another submarine or something in the mm -hmm. ocean, it sends back information to the main computer. It can tell you how far something was. Why? Because we know how fast that wave was moving. Mm -hmm. So if it's going X miles an hour and it ran into something in a few seconds, now we can calculate the distance. Distance divided by time and speed and things like that. So there are metrics and things that can be assessed just by feeling, just from that wave. So, and that's where I think meditation comes into play when you're syncing both the mm -hmm. cognitive mind of the brain and then the subconscious mind of the heart. The things that we quote unquote just learn by heart or know by heart, they're just a, a part of our, the fabric of our being. Like I grew up terrible in math. I was intimidated in math. I probably failed most math classes because I didn't even care to listen. There was nothing there that they didn't want, like the way I solved the problems. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I, uh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't pay much attention. When I became a programmer though, and I noticed that everything that had to be programmed had to be named as a variable. And I'm, I'm looking at formulas and I'm realizing how the, how the universe works. And it's, everything in life is a variable. Every person you know, every car you see moving, at what speed, these are all variables. Um, your plans, they exist in this multi-dimensional space where you have to make choices. Uh, and you're choosing from these variables to get to certain outcomes. So that kind of made me fall in love with, with math, seeing that literally everything was math. math. Math is the language of the universe. That's why we can write formulas for anything. Um, that's why everything can be explained mathematically. So, for instance, digital information, when we record stuff with cameras and that gets depicted on a screen by way of ones, zeros, pixels, and coordinates, that's all math. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything can be translated into mathematics. Yeah, that's why it's so dope because, like, it's a superpower, right? It's like... If you want to understand anything, if you want to understand the universe, you understand God, you have to understand math. Too. That is a fact. Now, and, and let's say, okay, you don't understand it, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want to have a, a deeper understanding, I should say, right, mm -hmm. of the root, because there's things that, you know, people have, and, and this is where belief comes in. It's like, mm -hmm. well, I don't have to know how God does it to understand right. God, Right. But when you want to do and be as your father, now when mm -hmm. you start thinking mathematical, now you have the mm -hmm. ability to do things, to take ideas from the head, right? To where it's like, all right, things are created twice, once in the mind and in reality. So mm -hmm. now, have an idea. All right. You know, there's this, uh, there's, they call it the 20, it's a, it's a mind, it's a mind uh, experiment where it's a 20 question experiment, right? Okay. I forgot who's the author of it, but he says, think of any problem, then think of 20 ways, right, to get to the solution of that. <laughs> so like, let's say whether you're talking about, you know, becoming a millionaire, whether you're talking about pushing out a product, right, mm -hmm. whether whatever it is, think about 20 solutions. You have to go through every iteration, Yeah, yeah. right? And he was saying that this formula has created more millionaires than any other formula mm -hmm. that he knows. Because he said, by the time you get to the 20 of one, it's usually the best one. <laughs> right. Right? Because you've now, you got to think about it, you've now went through 20 iterations and variations. Mm -hmm. And what, it, what is it doing? It's forcing the mind, right, to go through this process mm -hmm. without having the experience. Right. Right? Because experience means that we come up with one idea, we go experiment, right? And then we got to go back to the results. Right. Right? So it's like if you're a scientist, 
you know, you're doing this thought experiment, you know, and, and you're thinking 20 steps out. Right. Right. So now you will literally come up with the best version, right, mm -hmm. of the plan and then implement that. Yeah, yeah. Right. So now it's a higher self. It's not the right. self that's rushing. It's not the self that's not thought out. It's the self that's more patient, the self that's yeah. more calculated, the self that's constantly improving. Right. Mm -hmm. And think about the 20th iteration of your thought. You know what I'm saying? With everything that you go do. And I was always taught, think five times before you speak and you might be right. Mm. But now think 20 times over <laughs> your ideas, right? <coughs> write them all down. So you got to literally go through the process, write them all down. That's a simulation. Right. Essentially, it's a simulation. And it's funny because in AI, machine learning, when we build models and train them, they run through iterations. That's mm. what we call them, epochs of the same task and the learning algorithm refines or brings it from its margin of error mm -hmm. closer. This happens mathematically, so the problem can be any problem. It's broken down to numbers. And it's essentially, okay, how far are we off? And this algorithm will kind of bring us a little bit closer yeah. and adjust all of the parameters to make that happen. But it runs through those iterations until it, um, we call it convergence. When, let's say we're looking at a bell curve and this is the true data, and the, the first prediction was way off here, mm -hmm. we want to bring those together so that they converge. Um, and then we say the AI is ready. But it's after so many iterations, uh, trying and exploring the different options, opportunities, by way of simulation, that it arrives at that you know, competent level. So, yeah. So, so all right, so this is, this is raw, because for me, I think about, we, we now have this beautiful, opportunity where everybody has a research assistant right mm -hmm. so let's say you go on claude.ai yeah claude.ai has an ai constitution where if it's wrong it will try to correct itself right mm -hmm. so okay. therefore it's not like chat gpt or chat gpt wrong you just with that answer <laughs> right <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so chat claude is like that responsible friend that's smart but sometimes you get stuff wrong mm -hmm. and then they'll call you and be like oh you know what i had that wrong actually i, I did yeah. my research i don't want you to operate off that false information <laughs> yeah. chat gpt he yeah, gonna pride. tell you something confidently like nah i said what i said it is yeah, what it yeah. is and you operating because that's the smartest friend you know, mm -hmm. but you're going off false information that was given to you very yeah. confidently. Claude got more integrity than most right. people. <laughs> yeah, most people. Claude got some integrity about himself. Like, I'm not, but nah, you ain't gonna say you learned that from me. So, you know, I say that because back in the, I say back in the day, and that's really just kind of like anything that didn't happen in this decade. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we're in the future, right? Right. So, Anything that didn't That's happen crazy. in this decade, right? So you have to think. Let's go back to two thousand before two thousand and twenty, actually. Yeah, yeah. Before two thousand twenty, it's a whole new reality, right? It's wild. To think so about. if we go pre two thousand and twenty, before the huge shift of reality, because mm -hmm. we are in a great transitioning of society. Go ahead, yeah. So, you know, there. If you wanted to have a, access to a vast amount of data, mm -hmm. right? Where would you get that from? Right now, typically you don't have the ability, and I'm talking about with no budget, mm -hmm. right? You can't go to a research firm and say, hey, I need access to this data in this particular industry so we can make better decisions. Right, right. Right? I want to see, you know, what's the future, where are things are headed. I want to see, you know, uh, where are the particular problems, what's the spending habits on it, right? What are the trends? So we can analyze this data with the team, yeah. and now we can make these decisions, right. right? So let's say even if they did that, let's say, you know what? Okay, you know, we got like 30,000 pages on that. I'm going to send right. that to you, right? So they send you all of this. You, How are you mm -hmm. going to, and your team, going to analyze that data? Maybe you don't even have the expertise to analyze that mm -hmm. data in the first place. They send it to you in the most technical and raw form <laughs> that they yeah, possibly yeah. can. Right, if Apple sends you their data on their user database and you know how people are now thinking about themselves, right, and how they're utilizing that information to create new products, right, mm -hmm. and new languages and you know, create new ways to appeal to their consumer in new ways. Yeah. So now they can make sure that they're constantly adapting to societal changes because they have all the data. Yeah, real right? time. 
it keeps them ahead of the curve. This data is gold. It's worth so much money because they don't have to guess and put something in front of you and see if you like it. They can just look at the data to see what you like, then put it in front of mm -hmm. you. So it gives them a massive hit, edge, right? And when it comes to being competitive in the market. Now, we fast forward to 2023. They come out with a technology and they say, listen, this technology is now going to give the average entrepreneur access to all the data. Mm -hmm. Data to where at a push of a finger, you can scrape the internet, ask it whatever question, and then tell it to quantify that data based on your education level and understanding mm -hmm. and customize it to your industry. Mm -hmm. Now, think about all of those things. So you have the higher data uh, research form, a data analyst, somebody yeah, yeah. prepared a report, like all of that money, you can't afford that as a right. startup, as an entrepreneur. A lot of money goes into just the research and development mm -hmm. aspect, right? So yeah, now yeah. we're saying that we've, we are in this era where everybody has access to these tools, mm -hmm. but because we are in the era of fast consumption, right, people aren't using them. Right, right. So fast consumption is, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, so, you know, I got this book, The Evolution of Digital, right? It goes okay. through everything. And when I was looking at this book, you know, this is about just web design up till today, right? Mm -hmm. Just the internet and then how it start going into streaming and then how people yeah. start adding these widgets and these plugins and how every iteration of like adding on to like these websites and the internet open up new possibility and changes and yeah, how it start yeah. changing different industries, right? And that's just for websites right so people understood the massive opportunity with websites they started digging in right mm -hmm. but now we're in this age where all right boom you know we got blockchain mm -hmm. right blockchain is i ain't gonna say it's fast consumed but products from the blockchain are fast consumed yeah yeah exactly. cryptocurrency was probably the slowest consumed <laughs> at a while because a lot of people didn't know yeah, yeah. but once people learned about it the fast it's consumption back. began mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because we're constantly looking for more stimulation. Mm -hmm. So, oh, crypto's here. I love it. How can I make money off of it? Wait. Yeah, yeah. The central idea that was surrounding it at first was to bank the bankless, mm -hmm. right? To create decentralized networks and opportunities for people to control their money and finance outside of the banking industry. Yeah. No. Let's figure out how we just going to make money. So FOMO kicks in, mm -hmm. right? So... Now you're seeing everybody, now your brain is firing, I got to jump in. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency comes, right? Bitcoin goes through these different halving cycles. After those halving cycles, you see different spikes, right? Mm -hmm. Market manipulation happen, boom, bow, right? Yeah. That's a technology that I still is not slowly consumed by the masses. And maybe mm -hmm. nothing ever is truly slowly consumed by the masses, mm -hmm. right? Maybe that's the naivety of the thought in the first place. Right. So then we get, let's say, NFTs. NFTs mm -hmm. come... Fast consumption. Yeah, same thing. NFT skyrocket. It goes high up, billions of dollars, mm -hmm. right? From being just maybe tens of millions and then at first being almost like no millions, yeah, yeah. right? Everybody and their mama is on it. The boar apes, the cats, the kitties, the galaxies, yeah. the toads, punks, everything is just there. Boom. <laughs> people are buying into it fast. When people are like, wait a minute. This represents new ownership. This represents new digital paths. This represents a mm -hmm. new way that we can go about utilizing the internet. Another thing that can take power away from institutions, yeah. give you the power, because people are to this day buying houses, right, yeah, without yeah. the train of paperwork in between that keeps a lot of people from doing things. Mm -hmm. So this is this system of, hey, this is a way you can use the blockchain. Again, right. it goes back to the blockchain, but fast consumption, if I'm not making money, it don't matter to so, me. No, yeah, yeah. So it comes and then it goes down. And even though today they're still saying it's, it's like a hundred plus million dollar industry. Yeah, exactly. Which is a huge industry. Mm -hmm. But because the spike of activity is not around it, the train of, uh, of, of FOMO is not around it, people are not going to slowly consume it, learn it, understand the value, implement it in their business, use it to transform, right, and empower themselves. Mm -hmm. So boom. So you got NFTs, you got SBTs. Right, the soul bound tokens, all of these things are coming, mm -hmm. right? You oh, got man. decentralized banking, right? Uh, and now, of course, we're in AI, 
Right. right? And there's so many other different things. But I say that to say this. AI comes, a person picks up ChatGPT for a week. Mm -hmm. Then they're back to Google. Right. Then they're back to asking a friend a question that they just bought a subscription for one of the most powerful tools <laughs> in human history Crazy. ever given to an average person to democratize access mm -hmm. to these tools. Right. Right? They got Claude, they got Bard, they got all these things. They got text to voice, text to image, text to video, yeah. duplication of image, right? You can you can sketch out yeah. an image of yourself, go to VizCon, not of yourself, but a product, mm -hmm. cutting out an industrial designer, have that product. You know, a what a a a, 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 a image. You know what I mean? Instantly. Exactly. So now you just skip the step in your business, and you can send that to you know uh, China and tell them, hey, make me this product per yeah. these specifications. And now you're ready to roll. Right. At first, it took me. It took me like, I think it cost me almost like six, seven thousand dollars. I was, I was paying for this designer to create me this industrial design for this prototype crown. Right. If I would have used this tool, it, it would have cost me fifty dollars yeah. a month. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. now, what's that does? Save me money, save me time, mm -hmm. right? So, but I'm slowly consuming them because I'm like, bro, I ain't reached the peak nowhere of what ChatGPT can do. I mm -hmm. should be focusing ten thousand hours on this and building my whole business around yeah. having access to this. Right, I feel you. So I want to get your thoughts on, you know, number one. The evolution of technology, but slow consumption era, or slow consumption and fast consumption. Because you slowly consume things, you learn them, you digest them. It's like microwavable food versus real food. You get the nutrients out of it, you so you can get the best out of it, so you can use it for what the true value is, right. not the hype of it, so that you can be stimulated. Oh, something new has come. Oh, aliens are here. And this puts people in this cycle of looking for more stimulation and we become addicts of the unveiling and the rolling out versus the actual usage so you don't mm -hmm. actually use it for its true value. Yeah, 100%. It's a, I used to sell music gear. And a lot of times producers, whether it was NPCs, stuff like that, it would come back if people didn't educate themselves first. It doesn't do what I needed to do. Like, what are you talking about? You don't even know what you just bought. Mm -hmm. So over time... I started recommending to people that, hey, before you even touch it, before you touch a knob or press a button, watch a video on it. Spend 45 minutes with a cup of coffee. Do something. Be patient with yourself. Um, kind of like when we were kids and they say, hey, we're going to read this story the first time. Listen. Second time, take notes. You know, it's, we, we need to digest information in, in twofold. To the experience, to, to familiarize ourselves with what we will be learning, and then the actual process of learning. And... Um, through doing that, like, yeah, I like to understand things systematically uh, and then their implications because that slow digestion really just comes from, from you know, fast consumption, you said. It comes from uh, fear. I don't even think it's all laziness. I feel like if more people knew their competence to understand certain things, that they would give themselves more time. But uh, I always revert back to when we were kids and we're learning our ABCs. We spent, it, it, you know, we're given language in bite size. You already know how to talk by the time you learn your ABCs. So you're seeing these little symbols, each letter that represents something. You don't even know you're getting the keys to communicate, write, read, all of these things. But it comes at that first step of, hey, digest this. So I'd say with, with technology, um, you're 100% right. Everybody should be spending 10,000 hours because we don't even know what is possible completely until we really play with it and, and have that trial and error. So, uh, and then the other end is fear. That whole job replacement thing, some people are just turned off by it. They don't even want to interact with it. Uh, but I always say like, you know, we don't even want the jobs that AI is going to take from us for the most part. <laughs> people don't want those jobs. So, um, yeah, I, I recommend all of us really buckling down and seeing how we can apply it to what we want to do. Uh, one thing you spoke on is like the, the blockchain. And notice how NFTs, which were a huge, a huge boom, right? And then the cryptocurrencies, another boom. And how NFTs gave cryptocurrency their biggest use case, essentially. One of the biggest use cases. But 
we would have never known had we experiment had not experimented or really dove in and started exploring the implications on blockchain. Oh, first we were sending messages, sending information. Now it's like, hold on, I can actually encode this and, and track who owns it. It became much larger, but mm -hmm. not until we explore and you know tinker with it. So, do you think? All right, so yeah, and and there's so much more I can go on on that. And this is why, like, I rather a lot of times teach in private. Mm -hmm. When you teach in public, people only listen to the part that they want to hear. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? They don't listen to the warnings. They don't listen to none of that. They go, <laughs> all of that go, blah, 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 blah. what do you say? How much money can I make? Boom. That's yeah. it. They don't listen to, hey, don't do this. The industry is going to go here. It's going to bubble. It's going to do this. Like, no, I don't, don't buy it. Make them. They don't listen to none of that. Mm -hmm. They just, tell me how to make me some money. Right? right? But that's society and, and I learned to pull back on a lot of those things and I don't see it a lot of time you know because I want those people that is a thought leader uh, a lot of people stop pushing out their content when I stop pushing on mine mm. right because they don't have their own original thoughts on it mm. right because when yeah, I go into something I like to, to dive into it a bit mm -hmm. it's like it, there's like shout out to my brother uh, Chicago crypto brother he's deep into like the DeFi mm. right he's deep into the money matrix I'm like if I'm if I'm learning something, I want to go to a brother like that. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? That's constantly on it every day, not just when the market is up or when the market right, is right. down. It's a trend, right? I want to go to people that are always consuming it and trying to figure out the best use of it and mm -hmm. the value of it, mm -hmm. right? And you know, I'm I'm really trying to focus and dial down more on media because there's so much power in it. Peace, family. I know it's a whole lot of AI talk. But understand that we do have one place that you can go to to check out all of the top AIs, the ones that have been made and the ones that are being made, all of the newest ones. Go to thewarehouse.ai and you can see all of the AIs that we talked about from text to image to text to video to text to speech, right? The ones that you can clone yourself, whatever it is, keeping you up to date, go to thewarehouse.ai ASAP. Peace. Family is 19 Keys. We back for another 19 minutes. 19 minutes. 19 minutes. 19 minutes. You had mentioned earlier about how things manifest twofold, right? Once it happens here in the mind, and then it happens externally. Uh, when I was about 20, 21, I wrote a quantum theory that I sent to Max Tegmark. He wrote a book, actually, Our Mathematical Universe, and then James Fallon, he's a neuroscientist. And basically, I made an equation for manifestation, and it's hinged on Einstein's theory of relativity, proof of relativity. He has E equals MC squared, which we use all of the time. Um, and we're all familiar with that equation, but most people don't understand its implications, so for those watching who don't, I'll break it down a little bit. Uh, e equals MC squared, Einstein, that's what made him famous, you know, well, legendary, he was already famous. But it's essentially saying that energy, E, equals mass, or all matter, moving at the speed of light squared, because C is the speed of light. So E equals MC squared, and what that means is energy um, equals mass moving at the speed of light times the speed of light. So what I did was, since that's already kind of been validated, we, we use that theory in models for our universe, for modeling the environment. Um, that's what governs the atomic clocks, space time, and all of these, of these things. Um, but I said, if that's true, I wrote what's called a mathematic proof for it. The opposite of multiplication is division. They teach us this in high school. when We have to make proofs, right? So I said, if E equals MC squared, then E divided by C squared equals M. I took this, the multiplication of C squared away from over here and I put it on the other side. And in layman's terms, it's saying that if energy is fast matter, then all matter is slow energy, which we, which physicists have kind of already brushed on. Like there was a guy named Max Planck who said all matter is energy moved to a slow vibration. 
Um, that's important because Einstein spent most of his life looking for the grand unified field theory. If we know that everything is atoms, 99% space, it's always moving, then how come when I see it, it's a solid object? How come when I touch it, you know, I can feel it, it's fixed. I don't see things vibrating. It doesn't feel like it's 99% space to me. So uh, he, he theorized that there's an interface happening. There's a process going that kind of translate all of this energy into the solid experience. Just to, I feel like he had his equation backwards. He knew that matter equaled energy. He didn't know how it happened. So what my theory does is by taking that equation, reversing it, and saying that, well, if we slow down energy, you get matter, I, I started thinking about perception more and how our senses work. So we have eyes, but our eyes have photoreceptors in them, light. They're literally, you know, small pieces of photons. That's why when we look people in the eyes, you see, you see much of their eye, but you see a glimmer that you kind of can't see through because it's something of the same frequency encountering itself. It's light seeing light. Um, and you can't have two things of the, you know, occupying the same space at the same time. They're on the same frequency. It's kind of like how a, a frequency of the same, you know, next to a glass, if you play that frequency, it'll break. It's a similar thing. They, they conflict. So, but what's happening is when we see things, when we perceive our environment, our eyes are slowing down energy, and I'm allowed to see it as matter. So that process of, of uh, energy being slowed down by C squared, my theory says that it's happening in the mind. Our brain is a particle decelerator. So scientists use particle accelerators all of the time, speed up particles to um, emulate the beginning of the universe, smash atoms together. So I said, no, our brains are particle decelerators. We take all of this energy that's happening in rapid succession and we slow it down so that it makes sense that we have an interface. This reality is an interface um, with each other because if I were to perceive everything as it was, those waves, those molecular particles, we'd pretty much phase through each other. Right, kind of like you know, waves in the ocean. So uh, you know, we wouldn't be able to distinguish um, ourselves from each other. We wouldn't have a sense of identity. Um, and it's further validated by, say, you're running extremely fast. You know, you're running like 100 miles an hour, whatever. If I'm standing still, if I'm running five miles an hour, I can't be next to you. I can't have a conversation with you, right? And that's essentially what's happening with our eyes. There's a reason I can't hear light because the speed that ears interpret at is for sound. It's at Mach 1 through you know, our range of sound. It's not fast enough to perceive light, but the light in my eyes can. So it's essentially that, hey, if you're vibrating on my frequency, we can communicate. And our brains, through our senses, slow down energy, whether it's sound waves, we have the eardrum, and through the, again, the photoreceptors in our eyes to slow down the photons around us. Our sense of touch through the electromagnetic field that we're always oscillating as well. <clears throat> and um, knowing that, I was able to say, you know, re-engineer my entire approach to reality when it, when it came to manifesting and how do I get the results out of this, uh, this quantum environment. You know, knowing that formula, like you said earlier, if you know these mathematic principles, you can reverse engineering and get certain outcomes. So from there, I said, okay, well, if energy can be converted through mass, if it's slowed down by the speed of light squared, perception is the mechanism to do that. I really just have to perceive my ideas. How do I, do, how do I get them from you know, here to, to perception? Well, see it. Actually see it. Actually hear it. Talk to yourself. And then curate your behaviors around that lifestyle you want. That whole fake it till you make it kind of thing is, is a process to manifestation. Not saying, oh, go around lying or front. No, embody that, um, you know, be that component of the reality that you want to have. Be the missing piece because the universe has to reciprocate. You know, frequency can't be faked. Um, it's a basic call and response. And through the development of that theory, understanding the, the mind, the brain as a particle deceleration ma machine that's moving at C squared, that's slowing down all the particles by C squared, um, I was able to bring in a lot of my own goals into fruition. But again, it took a lot of uh, programming of myself. I always say the first AI I programmed was my, my own ego. Um, to, to belief, mm -hmm. right, without seeing it, to, uh, and then again, start perceiving it. Uh, like, carry the habits within myself, you know what I'm saying? So. 
Y'all, I mean, it, it, that gets me to observation because mm -hmm. the variable of reality is consciousness, mm -hmm. right? And each person has um, varying levels of conscious perception and observation. Mm -hmm. That the observer is not separate from what they're perceiving. Mm -hmm. We are attached to our perceptions and what we perceive. Mm -hmm. Everything that we see is also, you know, a part of the way we see the world is a part of, you know, the way we think, mm -hmm. who we are, right? It's like we can, if, if I view the world from like this soldier traditional lens of like, let's say masculinity, I may see one person and say that that's a man's man. I may see another person <laughs> and say that this is like a sigma or beta man, right? Yeah, yeah. But are they really? I don't mm -hmm. know. Maybe I could be perceiving a color they wear or a mannerism, right? And applying my perception onto their reality. Mm -hmm. And it becomes my reality. And that's kind of the thing of like, is it, is it the truth yeah. or is it your truth, right? right? And the question becomes is, is there a differentiation, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's in the, in the phase, right? of something becoming the truth versus it being your truth is the mm -hmm. idea of fake it too. Not that you make it per se until the world perceives it to be true as well, mm -hmm. right? And you can live it yeah, because yeah, there's yeah. things that I've said, you know, that was, you know, me becoming and now I'm there, yeah, right? Yeah. And it was me every day putting in work to match the frequency of this thought that's already in my head, but it requires me to f shift my reality by my actions on a daily basis by mm -hmm. constantly spinning energy into it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, goes to this point, so let's say you walk around, and this is just a key for everybody, just on some networking and mm -hmm. adding to uh, uh, right. uh, manifesting power. So let's say, tell me what is like something that you're working on like right now Especially in view that if you, if more people knew about it, if you had more help, it could help you get there faster. If you put it in the mind of more people, mm -hmm. give me anything. Uh, training our own AI models, right? Yeah. We need a lot of people to to gather that data, ask the right questions. Yeah. That's one of the edges that places like Apple, et cetera, have had. Mm -hmm. But by using these audiences, uh, people like yourself have, we can aggregate a community to train models on. Uh, things we want to hear about and mm -hmm. teach about. So. so, the moment that you told me that, you put that into my consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer just in yours now. Your mm -hmm. ideas are now in my head, right? So now I'm sharing that now, based on my information, probably I can visualize that. Based mm -hmm. on you know, my resources, maybe I can help you with it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if I look, listen to it in the utility, maybe that I can apply it to my own life, and then when I start, if I help one to invest in it or fund it or collaborate with it, now we're, it's, a, it's a quantum entanglement of thought, mm -hmm. right? right? That that idea is no longer just in your head. It's, when you share it, you're putting your idea right. in other people's head, <laughs> right? Right. And the idea of most people imagine that is like, yo, yeah, I'm throwing it inside their head, in their brain. But consciousness is not confined and not constrained by just the brain. Any, yeah, yeah. Consciousness is an invisible stream like Wi-Fi. You right. can't see Wi-Fi, but you can be constantly connected to it. And consciousness is that same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, but to the point though, if you walk around, everybody you meet, and they say, hey, how you doing, man? What you got going on? And the first thought you tell them, right? Hey, I'm actually working on this AI, you mm -hmm. know, model that I'm, I'm, I am wanted to be able to create for different people, whatever use case, right? Mm -hmm. So now, every time you meet somebody, you're projecting your ideas, you're putting them in their head mm -hmm. versus, man, ain't nothing going on. Right. Right. <laughs> right. No, yeah. because you never know when you meet that person that can actually help you with it, Yeah. right? Yeah. So instead, you may meet random people all the time. I don't care whether it's men, whether it's women, or whether, like I'm building high-level media. We, we want to build high-level studios, mm -hmm. you know, put textbooks out about AI that we want right. to work on, put the textbooks out about, you know, um, the stocks and financial literacy, and then on the inside, it has these video component that's a curriculum as well. So it's like, if, let's say if I'm meeting everybody, as soon as they ask me what I got going on, I'm literally telling them the most pressing things that's on my mind that I'm right. working on. Right. 
So now what I'm doing is I'm adding them into my idea, right? Mm -hmm. I'm adding them into the consciousness of these ideas. I'm put, and now their mind will help me form it as well. Right. Based on their resources, their ideas, their referrals, whatever it may be. And to me, that's a greater way of collaboration <clears throat> um, and connectivity with your ideas versus just giving somebody your name and giving them like the same, you know, answer, repetitive, because you're taught to say, how you doing? Oh, I'm good, I'm yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, no, nah, go to a place and actually tell people what you're working on. Whatever is the most pressing thing on your mind, right? And then see how much faster that helps it spin into reality mm. and match the frequency of what's necessary for that to be manifested. Yeah, yeah. So that's like, you know, if you will, an occult networking Secrets of <laughs> yeah. manifestation. Right. Say what's on, not just what's on your mind, say the thing that you want to manifest that's on your mind. Mm -hmm. Right? You could meet a, I'm telling you, like, you, you just never know. You could meet a stranger coming out grabbing some coffee and they say, you know, you know, uh, and y'all just have a casual conversation and you tell them what you're working on. Mm -hmm. Right? Maybe it, it re comes out of nothing. Maybe they're like, oh, you know what? I got a friend out of that. Yeah, yeah. Right? How else could they help it unless that you enlighten them? Right. So it's like this is a way of like creating this collaborative consciousness, right, to where you're adding people onto your project. Mm -hmm. And speaking it out loud is giving shape, but it's giving vibration and just giving form to it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Thoughts that are never said just get stuck in your head. Right. You know, you're... You, you, Dreams are not supposed to just be between you and your bed. You feel me? They're supposed to be but, outside. Right. That, that's interesting because I'm, I, was re, I was thinking the other day about how stress, there's, there's healthy stress, right? And there's unhealthy stress. Stress in the, the body and your cells, when something's going wrong, they, they kind of have, they stress out themselves, but then they have to stress out everybody around them to address the problem, right? You have to shine light on what's going on so that everybody can pull resources to, to address it. Uh, it's pretty much made me think of that. A lot of times, part of it is programming. Part of it is, I guess, we don't think people care what we got going on, so it's like, I'm not even about to tell right. them, hey, get it, or uh, the fear, the competition, egos. There's a number of reasons that we've seemingly been socially engineered to kind of keep quiet, right. do things independently. And it may just be out of that fear of cooperation, you know. So. Well, yeah, I mean, I think networking is such a necessary thing and the art of it. I'm one of those people, I feel like I could be socially awkward sometimes because I like to start in the middle of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, I want to yeah. start like I know Let's get you. there, yeah, yeah. Like, I hate texting because I'd rather just call you, what's up, what you got going on? Like, I don't care who I, who I just met, I hate formalities. Yeah, yeah. I right? Feel. Like, I got to act a certain way until, like, that's why sometimes I, I be meeting so many people, but I can't connect with them because I don't feel like going through the formalities <laughs> of, like, you know, the hey, hi, what's your favorite color type of spill. Mm. It's like, yo, this is what I got going on. What you got going on? Like, I'd rather, if I just meet you, I'd call you, man, what's happening? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? What's the flow? What's in the day? Like, right. let's build. And then at the same time, I might call you on some, like, listen, I got this idea you know, I, I need you to help me on, on some creative direction. You can say yes or no. Mm -hmm. I'm cool with that. All but right. it's like usefulness determines your value. So like, why are we knowing each other if we can't be, be a resource mm -hmm. to each other and be useful to each other yeah. in some capacity, right? right? Like there, there's, you know, I've been blessed that I've been around really good people who've been walking me indoors lately. And when they walk me indoors, they've been introducing me. And, you know, they like, yo, this is so-and-so, this is what he got going on. Oh, so I get right, to start yeah. in the middle. So I ain't got to warm up the whole, hey, I'm 19 Keys, yeah, I'm a thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's better when you can have other people introduce you, mm -hmm. right? That's always key. Let somebody else introduce you if you can, Yeah. right? It, 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 it's, it's number one because you're getting it from a different perspective. Different perspectives, you know, it's like when you speak on yourself in the third, they say it creates and raises more empathy because it's from mm -hmm. a different perspective than your own. So you're not thinking from a first person. You're thinking mm -hmm. from a third person, right? So 19 Keys does this. It automatically makes me think outside of the, yeah, the, the, of the, the ego, operator, yeah. right? And as an observer of self, mm -hmm. right? The same way someone else would observe me versus me speaking. And it's funny because the natural tendency to say that this person is like ego maniacal by speaking in the third 
not realizing that it actually does raise more empathy to speak in the third because you're thinking outside of self and seeing self from a different lens of observation than the person going through it as the operator but the observer, mm. right? And, you know, a lot of people never do that. That's crazy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? People don't do that. And, and you'll yeah. find a lot of geniuses and a lot of very important people, a lot of times, they speak in the third. Yeah, I know. I like to. It, yeah. it helps me contextualize, see everything in context. Right. You know, because we, we have our own lens, you know, out, well, inside looking out, versus that narrator perspective. Mm -hmm. You kind of feel like you know the ending of the story. Already. Right. But it's wild because the I think, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Bible or around the time the Bible was made is when we, first, we get our first first person writing, mm. I being used in, in text. Before that, all eyes were divinity, mm. whether it was like Paul speaking or, you know, no matter the religion, it was coming from a God or a divine source. Uh, and when people refer to, to themselves in the third person, think of like Hulk, it was looked at as this primitive caveman-like thing. But the way I look at it is like our I don't. I won't even use. It. I don't like the term. But primitive experiences were, you know, the beginning of us in this game, the soul, the spirit, consciousness in this game. So we were more true to where we came from in realizing that okay, this isn't really me. You can cut this off for real, and I'm good. I can I'll move right. around. You know. So yeah, because um, I mean, let's say that if your arms and your legs are cut off and they're replaced with you know, more, more, more right. body arms and legs, it's still you. That would be just as much mine, yeah, yeah. So it's like, this is my arm. Mm -hmm. You're saying that because it's attached to it, but if I attach something else mm -hmm. and it moves the same way, is that not still mine. yours? Right. Right, That's like, right. it's this idea that we are not our body, number one. Mm -hmm. We are our consciousness, but we see ourselves through our body, right? Yeah, it's, a lens of, it's a lens of you know, observation of self-observation that mm. we see and we filter our existence through. Mm. But I'm not my body. That's why good looking people, they think too highly of themselves, mm. right? Because they know that other people are observing them based mm. on facial structure, right? And that they are automatically having a, a higher degree of confidence or appreciation in this person, right? Mm. It's funny because, and I know this is an interesting thing to say, but and I'm not saying this from a beauty standpoint, because beauty, you know, of course, it really is in the eye of the beholder from mm. a standpoint of internal beauty and inner beauty is what matters the most. But when it comes to societal standards mm. of what beauty is constructed to be seen as, different facial features. Symmetry, proportion. Yeah, symmetry. That's a very real thing. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And only a, actually a small percentage of the population falls into that category. Mm. Right, which is very interesting because when you go around <laughs> in most places, you don't realize that, but you see it so much on your phone and media, mm -hmm. you feel like it's a larger percentage of the population. Right, right. But it's right. not. It's actually a very small percentage yeah. of population who fit that that symmetry of what's considered to be the standard right. of beauty, whether that's it's who we follow on Instagram, or not. <laughs> not the right, right, and, and but that's social programming and social engineering. So a person feels like they hit the lotto if they fit that symmetry mm. of what society grades, mm. and then they see themselves through that, and they say, "Well, everybody doesn't have this. It means it's rare. It means it's valuable." Right. How about I focus on this aspect of self because that person wasn't born with that, mm -hmm. right? And then this is where you get a shallow society, right. right? Where people become more artificial. And so, you know, that's such a, a hologram and it's such a shallow existence and it robs people of the depth of experience they mm -hmm. could go through, right? If they stop too. viewing self mm -hmm. through the lens of physical mm -hmm. symmetry and other people's observation of self, mm -hmm. right, versus actually going into the more philosophical nature of existence and using your mind and like becoming more, mm -hmm. right? It's very rare that when a person sees an extremely beautiful woman mm -hmm. and she's like deep into these philosophical things <laughs> and like she's yeah. super intelligent. It's, it's a very yeah, rare occurrence yeah, because yeah, yeah. society says that, oh, you don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, life is the expression of consciousness. Life is the observation, the appreciation, right, of, of 
the being, you know what I'm saying, and experiencing what is it to be? What is it to have curiosity mm -hmm. and to satisfy that curiosity? What is it to have longing for something and then to bring that into fruition, <laughs> right? Versus, oh, I'm pretty, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. Now, that highlights so many different things, and it comes in layers because if you think of, well, my brother used to say this, he's like, you know, bad chicks don't have to be smart. You, a girl, she goes somewhere, a, a guy's gonna tell her what she needs to know, mm -hmm. or just put her in a position, or just take care of what she needs taken care of. Right. You know, it's the reason you don't see a woman under a car or under the hood. Yeah. I've always been into the more intellectual side of things, but I love the symmetrical, proportionate woman. Mm -hmm. and. I think it hit, it takes a, a long time for a lot of us to be like symmetrical proportional women. That was the most politically <laughs> correct, slim thick, uh, you know what I'm saying, descriptive. Yeah. I've ever heard. You can't say nothing. Now, I love, I'm I on love HLC. a symmetrical proportional woman who uh, you know fits the standards of beauty. You know what I mean by societal definition. Yeah, yeah. Look, we, ain't, we ain't getting canceled, right? So no, but, but but at the same time, that goes back into observation and consciousness that. Of course, women view through the male, as they call it, the male gaze or the mm -hmm. male lens. And, and what this can create is so many different layers of insecurities and issues, mm -hmm. especially because society is mostly viewed specifically as like, I seen a post about Lil' Kim and it was like, no Lil' Kim bashing because you're not also talking about how, you know, white patriarchals you know, mm -hmm. systems have made people, you know, degrade themselves to try to fit these standards to mm -hmm. see themselves as beauty because the Afrocentric or the Afro Asiatic or, you know, the, the, the darker melanated women weren't seen as the standards of beauty, mm -hmm. right? Based on what society had pushed on them. So colorism, right. right? And, you know, white patriarchy. And I say white patriarchy because when people say patriarchy, they paint it as if oh, I mean, it's a, yeah, no, yeah like it's a, patriarchy is a power system. Yeah. It's also societal engineering, but it's about the power of patriarchy. Because mm. everybody, you know, all males in a system of patriarchy have a, a, a particular amount of privilege, if you will, because hey, you're a man. So one would say that, right? Mm. And so for the sake of argument, Let's say that, but when it comes to making decisions, right? Mm -hmm. My brother Van Lathan had posted about like women just getting the right to own bank accounts mm -hmm. uh, in the 70s, mm -hmm. you know, but at first they had got it really in the 60s, but banks did not acknowledge it until the 70s. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay, well, you know, that was something that, you know, white men completely by themselves, 100% decided <laughs> yeah, on. That was that. not something that... <laughs> You know, we had voting power in. Yeah. That was not something that we were in the ciphers of saying that, yeah, let's keep them down like this. No. And you have to understand that when you have people in power and position that create these engineer society, mm -hmm. everybody that falls into it is a victim. Right, right. Right? The male and the female. Mm -hmm. Right? The male to view himself a certain way. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, and the female to view herself a certain way. Right, they are both become victims of society. Right, right, and so the males <clears throat> were able to even see themselves from a higher level of consciousness and intellect. There was an intellectual society, mm -hmm. but the man was, you know, you work, provide. You know, what I'm saying, you go work a laborious job. Yeah, you're not got everybody is not in this scientific <laughs> paradigm of figuring out life and philosophy. You got to go work. Right, right. You're just seeing for your physical laborious abilities. Nobody mm -hmm. care about your mind and your opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what? a small percentage. Yeah. And it's important to understand that there was always a small percentage of people who could even make a living off that. Mm -hmm. And then when you fast forward, when the men did want to use their brain and talk about the way that they see society, they start, you know, in, in, in uh, popular, you know, society or uh, media then that's when you get portrayed as the smart guy, you know, mm. is corny and is lame. And then that was programmed, yeah. right? So it was like, nah, well, I can't. And then it become the whole tip. So mm. consciousness, you know, was, was always framed in a way where men and women 
right? The, the, the intelligentsia of society was never seen as the popular or the most valuable. Mm -hmm. Only in white society has that seen. Mm -hmm. Einstein was a famous scientist, mm -hmm. right? There's, George Washington Carver was, but he wasn't accredited that same level of appreciation as Einstein, yeah, yeah. right? He, the, what he did with his nuts after they chopped off his nuts was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No disrespect to George Washington Carver, brilliant man. But I'm just saying, like, his patriarchy is real, right? Matriarchal systems are real. And I mean in the sense of the possibility, if you have a household, that has no father, that's a matriarchal household, mm -hmm. right? And what we don't realize is that, unfortunately, it's the lack of having the patriarch in the household that created the most the imbalance in black family in societal structure, mm -hmm. right? Because the matriarch and the patriarch was necessary, mm -hmm. right, for different roles so that the child could have an even and balanced development, mm -hmm. right? So I don't believe, I say this all the time, I don't believe in a patriarch or a matriarch. I believe in a godriarch. Right. That's the collaboration. That's yeah, the yeah, synergy yeah. between the two to create systems that work for the vast society so that we don't get these broken children who's missing these balances. And it's not mathematical like the flower, mm -hmm. right, that doesn't have the components so that, you know, they can, you know, properly develop. Right with the light that's necessary. So first, I want to make this acknowledgement. I acknowledge what women have go through from a colorist standpoint, right? From a misogynist standpoint, from a lack of rights, a lack of being appreciated, from every aspect. It is acknowledged and observed and understood, right? And even now, being more deeply empathized than ever. And I want to put a pin on that point because women, number one, are, are amazing today, mm -hmm. right? Like you see the Simone Biles of the world, you see the Shakar Richardsons, right? You see, you know, all mm -hmm. of the, the Naomi's, you know, all of these young girls killing it across the board, showing up and saying, hey, we are here, we exist, mm -hmm. right? But not only we exist, we are the highest level, mm -hmm. right? And that's beautiful right. because one has to acknowledge that all the opportunities weren't afforded for women to showcase and to live mm -hmm. life at its highest level of saying that, yo, I have ideas I want to express. I have dreams that I want to see brought out into reality, right? And so I put a pin on it from there, right? right, right. Because definitely got to give kudos to where the development of women's consciousness and the expression of that, right? Now that a lot of the chains have been taken off. And then we go into... That, 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 uh, if you don't mind real quick, that, that opens a lot of doors on, you know, the masculine and feminine principles of the universe because we're simply those personifications mm. of those principles. And... You know, personally, I, I feel men are celestial. Women are terrestrial. Mm, That's why, like, that. you know, they, they nest different. You ever go into a woman's room, it's a little bit different. They, uh, it's why I can travel here to here with a backpack, and, you know, you ask a woman to get ready or to, to pull up somewhere, the bag might be a little bigger. Um, but things like that, they're more homely. They, they make the house into a home, right? Whereas men were on that hunt for certain things. Uh, whether, you know, a social hunt to, to make provisions. So when conversations of patriarchal systems versus matriarchal systems, and I agree with you that it should be a collaborative effort, but when it comes up, um, like, I, I advocate against a matriarchal society, right? And mm. strictly because it's never been shown to be successful. Not that we haven't had outliers where of... Uh, Oh, for this brief period in time, this was a thriving community. But let's, when we're honest about what happened to every empire, not long after it was um, drastically changed, and rules were made based on kind of the rules you would make for your your family in house. But no, you're you're governing a country with enemies. This is um. There's a level of realism that 
women typically don't need to encounter. They should never have to. They should not have to go fight a, a war on the front line. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but because we are responsible for those things, it's it's up to us to manage how certain things are handled. If that makes sense. So, um, but I don't. I also don't agree with a strictly patriarchal society. It's just that as decision making in terms of security. Because regardless, it doesn't matter how much a, a society thrives, people will come in and take it, period. If you don't have the defense first, it doesn't matter. You, the United States, we have the luxuries and freedoms here, not just because our ideas are the best. It's because we have the best or the strongest military and the best technology for the longest time. So it's really our ability to enforce our beliefs and ideas. And one of the things I feel women more, most recently haven't understood is that you know how, like, we'll tell kids, well, you're not an adult yet. So, you know, this is an adult world. This is grown folks talking. They don't even understand what they don't know. They haven't had these experiences. And, and this happens both ways for men and women. It's the same thing for a woman, where it's a quote-unquote man's world. We know who makes the laws. We know the minds governing, who's designing the clothing, who's making the laws, who's paying these models to do X, Y, Z. So... Um, they may not understand the motivations behind some of these uh, these agendas, the, the true intentions behind them. So, you know, it's as simple as if I tell my lady to dress a certain way coming out because of I know the implications. Now, the the pushback to that is usually, well, a woman is only needs to dress to protect herself from a man. We know that men won't argue that. But it's the fact that that's a real thing. Just because it's wrong doesn't mean we don't have to address it. So to that point, I feel like we take a more realist approach to certain things in, in assessing how they need to be handled. Whereas these days, it's, we, we'd love to live in a utopia where everybody's safe and we have equal power and exchange of ideas. But it uh, doesn't work that way. Peace, family, human here. We love to reward the quest for knowledge, so we have something special for you. We are giving away a free computer and also a programming course. All you have to do is go to High Level Conversations, the audio, subscribe, give it five stars, leave a like and a comment, and uh, you'll be eligible to be entered into a raffle. You'll hear from us soon. Well, I think you covered a lot, right? Uh, but the argument, of course, yes, would be the women who say that they can't dress how they want to because, yes, of the male gaze and Men, and to your point, that is real, which is why a person would say, don't do this and don't do that, right? And then a person would say, protection requires submission. Because the, the other third of the conversation is that men should protect women. Statement. Then it says that, all right, what are the, what are the parameters and what are the qualifications, right? that would allow you to protect those women, right? So how can you fit within the requirements that would allow me to protect you, right? And this doesn't go just for women. It's like if you got children, right? If you, if, whether it's my brothers, whether it's anybody that asks for my protection, they have to also take my advice, right? Because part of protection is the same way if you have a security detailed and they say, well, listen, if, we, if you want to go here, we can go here, but this is how we have to go, right? Um, here's the people that's going to be there. This is the way we need to move. I would advise you not to bring this. I would advise you to move that way. I would advise you to leave at this time. This is the best way I can see as the safest path. Or they say, I don't think we should go at all because we did the math, checked it out. I don't think it's a good decision, right? And so if you say, ah, forget all that, let's just go, you're putting yourself in danger, you're putting them in danger. So now, not only they have to protect themselves, they have to protect you. So that's really not, protection is, of course, pro before, right? So if a person does not listen and submit and they don't fit within a criteria, because even if, let's say, you know what? There's certain people that we won't protect because it's like you do too many things that are too at risk. You are very high risk detail, right? So there's like certain rappers 
they be wanting to do too much. They want to go all the jury to the hooded spots, yeah, yeah. right? And, and be doing too much in the security like, listen, man, you putting us in danger. I don't think we can cover this. Yeah, they can't assure you. Know you right, they want to assure you. They won't even take you as a client. Mm -hmm. And there are so many people that can't be taken as a client for mm -hmm. this idea of protection. Then you have a society of young males who are not protectors. Yeah, they're not even qualified. Then, yeah. not only if you are protector, you're usually a lone wolf. Mm -hmm. So if you're a lone wolf, you're out there by yourself standing up in a society to fit the traditional role of what mm -hmm. you assign as one of you know, your core values, mm -hmm. right? And things that you should do based on how you identify self but then when you do it, nobody has your back. Mm -hmm. So now you start creating this. And, and I'm speaking on like, this is how males are thinking. They're creating 100%. these assessments to say, man, shit, I'm not going to stand up because if I do, nobody's going to bail me out. Nobody is going to help me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this person that I'm trying to help, they might not even appreciate me. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the conundrum of society, right, right. right? That protecting as a male who fits into that standard of what I believe is the original masculine right. right identity, I also understand that society is no longer pushing the prevalence or the narrative of the original masculinity mm -hmm. while at the same time asking for some of the responsibilities that come along with that to be yeah. adhered to. And while not celebrating it in any aspect, in media, and music, and <clears throat> culture, on social media, nowhere. Yeah. So it's like, it's an, it's, and, and this is just speaking towards a realistic thing that you have to kill the expectation that males are going to behave in this original masculine yeah. manner. Yeah. It's no longer the reality. Mm -hmm. Most of them don't know how to protect themselves, so they're not going to be able to protect anybody else. Mm -hmm. Then you have the climate of this so-called gender war where males are against females and females are against males, yeah. right? So both of them are dogging each other. Right. Then the black males, specifically, I'm speaking from my culture or climate, but this is not just from, it's a societal thing. It's not just a black cultural thing. Mm -hmm. They say, well, listen, black women dogging us on social media. So now they got this attitude about themselves. The bitterness. Yeah. Whether, it's, whether it's feminine or whether it's girly or whatever it may be, mm. you know, this is their attitude. You have to be able to assess things for what they really are, not mm. what you think they should be or want them to be. Right. So you have to, okay, I'm realistic. This is reality. This is one, two, three. Because we, I've seen, you know, there's articles about like women going missing in this day and age just out here in, in and there's these two models in L.A. that, you know, uh, blocks from each other. Both were models, you know, right, that were killed or mm. they died, right? Rest in peace to them good sisters and their family. And it's like you think about those things and it's like, how do we prevent those things, mm -hmm. right? How do we have a society of prevention, mm. right, so that the protection is not even, so the prevention is the protection. Right. Versus exactly. we have to now get <clears throat> vengeance. Yeah. So... That draws me into, no, I, I don't believe in a matriarchal society whatsoever. I, I think it's a fantasy world, you know, it's like some Xenos type stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? But also, I've seen so many patriarchal institutions, systems, and organizations fail mm -hmm. over and 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 over right. again. I know the collaboration is the only thing that matters. Right. Yes, we live in this world that is ran by forces that have been doing this for so long. It's a war. It's a battle. It's power. The power can only be, it can be understood as a spiritual system, right? Esoteric system, mm -hmm. right? A psychological system, right? But it is a logical system that one goes to to maintain this power that has mm -hmm. to be fought a certain way. Mm -hmm. Forces can come to disrupt that, mm -hmm. right? And I believe women do have the power because I look at it and I say, it's a reason why women are at the forefront of the face of dismantling white supremacy. Oh, yeah. Right? When it comes to, it's going to be a black <clears throat> woman that's going after the politicians that's crooked mm -hmm. or a black woman that's this, that, and the third. Women do have a power. The thing is, is that it has to be in collaboration and cooperation. Mm -hmm. All men can't be the enemies. All women can't be the enemies. We can't mm -hmm. speak in blanket terms 
because we don't leave nuances for us to have cooperation. Mm -hmm. So this is an operation for both of us to have a just future. It has to be a cooperation. Right. I say this in so many episodes. Black men have the worst statistics of all groups. Mm -hmm. So we're not at this point of privilege. Mm -hmm. We're not at this point of thriving mm -hmm. so prison. high yeah. that we are we are just killing it in patriarchy. Mm -hmm. No. We're <laughs> we don't experience none of that at all. White patriarchal systems, <clears throat> or let's just say American systems, right? Because I've never in my life seen a black male fund. Mm -hmm. Never yeah, in my yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. Never do I see, hey, Chase Bank have a fund for black males. Mm -hmm. And when you say it, it's like, well, why would they need to? Because you have to address the systematic issues that have happened. It's the same reason that women have funds. Mm -hmm. And every other group have funds set up because they're saying that this group has had a wrong done to them right. and to address that. And you can go by every decade from 1910 to say, okay, what was going on? Okay, we had, of course, overt racism, murder, killing, destruction, mm -hmm. white supremacy at its all-time high to the 20s, right, to, to the 30s, right? We were talking about the, the going through the Depression area. The 20s, of course, we were going through Black Wall Street destruction, like destruction of towns, right? Coming out of the Depression era into the 40s, right? You know, you're going into the war, right? Yeah, yeah, coming out right. of the war, you're going into the war effects. Now you're coming Civil out of the war, era. you got the drugs, you have PTSD Eesh. going into the 60s. You have this Afro-Asiatic, you know, uh, a militant revolution. Then that is, of course, more drugs thrown into it. And then it becomes, you know, this psychedelic era, right? To mm. where then media starts to throw in things like Superfly, the media programming <laughs> yeah, yeah, changes yeah. the militant gangster mm -hmm. right into the pimp, right? And the player and then the drug dealer. And then you got 80s, oh, yeah. right? Now we're talking about Bloods, Crip, Gang the Wars, gang, yeah, yeah. Crack, right? 90s, the hyper masculine era, overpolarized hip hop, fighting against the system. Right until it start to turn to Biggie and Pop beat fight against each other. Right then the twenty tens, the effeminization. Right over technology, police, and two thousand tens is an effect of all of those eras. Yeah, yeah. Right. So now you're looking at the side effects of all of these wars from every single decade in America over the last century, and then you get up to two thousand and twenty three and say y'all niggas ain't shit. It's like right, whoa, right, right. we have to regard the whole thing. And that's the high level view because when we look at women, women were there going through the same thing, Amen, yeah. plus dealing with the fact that they're in a, 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 a patriarchal world dealing with it as well. Yeah. So it's like, for me, I empathize because I look on both sides. Yeah. It's that feeling of powerlessness for women and socially, um, you know, because, and that's why they're so effective in their fight against the power structure right now is because the system really can't deploy the same methods to deal with women as they do with us, right? Mm -hmm. And also because they may even be more tactful uh, in their approach to, to dealing with these situations. I know I'm not going, to, I can't really go somewhere and stand outside with a bunch of signs and, and, and yell. And not to say that their methods are inefficient, but maybe it's just something, as being a man, I feel like I have to do something. Whether it's with well, my hands I, I or be actionable. I wouldn't but. say I wouldn't say that because women were always at the forefront, in the background, and in and in co creation oh, yeah, yeah. of every single movement that we've had. Right. Right? Every great black male leader had a beautiful woman beside him. Not behind, but side. Right him. there, yeah, yeah. That was his advisor. That was his shit, his co general, mm -hmm. making sure everything was solid. That was his, his eyes and ears. But what, what I more so mean is that they didn't assassinate Coretta. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, the, the, the way they have to deal with them, uh, men and women, the system deals with us is just going to be different because of our approach. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I think the best solution for us is really. To, to gain a self-awareness and kind of reevaluate what we want our roles to be in this new type of society when, okay, you know, women can do this now. We can. It's, you're not walking through the jungle anymore late night getting attacked by whatever, you know. At least not you, in America. Right. It's still happening in parts of the continent. <laughs> but yeah, you can come to the workforce. You can do certain things. Not every job is as dangerous. Most jobs are on the internet now. So, you know, um, but as we do reevaluate those dynamics, 
once money comes into play, that's also, it's like any, any business. Now we have to delegate power. And who are we going to say is in charge of what in a relationship? And that will be handled by a, you know, relationship by relationship business, uh, basis. Problem with that is how do you build socially when your community doesn't have an a edict or a codified way of governing your relationships? Because that's how we can all come together. My family meets your family. You, I know your wife is on the same as my wife. We all have that same governing code. So now we have an algorithm. We, we're a system and uh, we can become a body. That's it's just the most, that's the more interesting side that we have to kind of, as a community, yeah. as a people come together and assess. I just know that empathy, more empathy has to be employed. Fact. So much more empathy on both sides. Mm. When I think about the black man, I think about the black woman at the same time. Mm. The exact same time. Mm. It's never a separation. I know men that are just, it's the mental health issues within our community are frightening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're terrible. Yeah. What's happening to us, mass incarceration, you know, um, is, is really destroying some of our best and brightest. Mm. Would you yeah. say we're under genocide, like active genocide? When you look at our deaths, when you look at um, sterilization attempts, uh, like Yeah, there should be no point of society. Incarcerations. This, this, this should be a state of emergency that every group looks at. Especially in America, America is in a phase of losing its inf influence over the world. Mm. People used to want to be Americans. <laughs> right, right, right. You can't say that around the world. No, nah, I go out people, the country. I try to look like I'm, <laughs> I'm from there right. now. People look at Americans, you cocky, arrogant, yeah. you know, fools. Like you guys don't know nothing. Why? But look at our last presidents. <laughs> <laughs> right? We got Trump and we got Biden. That doesn't make America look Bro. good at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And so, you know, when, when you go look at, you know, the presidents have a very huge psychological effect on the rest of the world. Donald Trump did not make America look good. Mm. Right? He made America look buffoonish. Mm. Right? Around the world. Like, that's y'all president? Okay. Right, right. Right? Obama era made America look racist as hell, mm -hmm. right? White folks out there protesting, asking for Donald Trump, asking for his birth certificate and all kind of crazy <laughs> stuff. Yo, America bad. could no it's longer hide time. from a global brand perspective, mm -hmm. right? What it was, yeah, yeah, right? So from Obama era, the rest of the world looking like, dang, America over there racist as hell, <laughs> right? You got BLM Yo, popping up crazy. with huge protests about murders of young black boys. Mm -hmm. Right? And young women. Again, so insane. that changed America. Like, damn, it's dangerous over there. I thought the racism was over. Mm -hmm. They're not that informed about what's happening over here. Oh, so yeah. the huge news stories are what informs their, their ideas that are formed about what America is in mm -hmm. reality. Yeah. Right? And this is why the global news is more important. Nobody, people in other countries don't know about local news. Right, None of that right. matters. Mm -hmm. The nuances of how we view ourselves, they don't know nothing like about Geopolitics that. is... They know mm -hmm. 50 Cent more than they know Malcolm X. Right. Right? They're going to know Drake before they know Minister Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. Right? That's just a fact. Mm -hmm. Right? So they're not connected to our social issues, social identity, consciousness... Mm -hmm. None of that stuff that we view ourselves from, accomplishments, mm -hmm. innovations, inventions, none of this stuff. Big news stories. Right. Entertainment. That's what gets exported. So America, you know, is in a 500-year point where no nation has gone before. No mm -hmm. empire, rather. There is no, there's no history to study besides decline. Mm. Right? So when you only have a history of decline... Because usually you can go look back in history and say, okay, what's the next thing to do? Mm -hmm. You don't have that with this empire. Yeah, yeah. Right? We've yeah. reached that mark, that the point of no return for everybody else. Mm -hmm. So there's this dark space. Right? And so what do you do when you get to that point? Man, you have to haul ass. Right. You got to right. pull out every, every, everything that you've you got, thought about yeah. doing. This is now your end game. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the point in time where you pull out all the tech, all of the operations, you pull out every single thing that you can to do what? Maintain power. Mm -hmm. So the one brilliant thing that America could do, now I'll get this to you, America, for free. <laughs> one brilliant thing. That should be a great national interest to America, yeah. to make America great for once. Uh, right. right? And when I say for once, I'm talking about a place that is full of freedom, justice, and equality. 
right? If it doesn't have that, it cannot be great. Mm -hmm. We can excel in innovation. We can have all these different things. Without freedom, justice, and equality, it, don't, it won't work. And how do you do that? Give equity to black men and women. Yeah. So, so we have a stake in... in what happens if the, pop, the prison population decreases? What happens if that population that is the least educated, the least financed, get educated and financed? Mm -hmm. What happens if you give the proper medical and healthcare attention, right? And, and help transform and revitalize those neighborhoods to mm -hmm. increase a better quality of living, mm -hmm. right? To young black men in America, right? Right. What happens when that becomes the backbone of America, not from a cultural influence standpoint, right? I'm talking about the ideas of young tech gods like yourself saying that that 1.3% that goes from funding, mm -hmm. right? That they now trying to like even make it even worse because they said they don't believe in diversity, inclusion, and equity yeah, yeah, yeah. anymore. So <laughs> anything that was going up they're saying that's benefit. racist now yeah they're know? saying that that's the new racist is it's, it's specifically <laughs> focusing on groups mm -hmm. so but what happens if you do that you rise america up because not only number one we have the influence mm -hmm. the influence means that we control the spending power mm -hmm. because we decide what's cool mm -hmm. if you decide what's cool the person buys what's cool with the money that they have yeah, yeah. so now Black America, black men and women, we have the ability, look at what's happening with Deion Sanders in Colorado. It mm -hmm. is a pure the example shades. of crazy. controlling influence crazy. and spending power. He's, millions of people took their money out of whatever budget they have for accessories and decided these are the ones I'm going to spend. <laughs> yeah. They went from a ticket price that doubled up, tripled up, right, to go buy a ticket People are flying out there. Why? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. influence controls spending power. Mm -hmm. The average American makes somewhere around $34,000. They have to break that up into different segments from housing, from transportation, Crazy. from food, right, from entertainment. So all of those things have to be broken down. Now, everybody can't get a pie of that, piece yeah, of that yeah. pie. So you come and say, hey, these are the coolest clothes. These are the mm -hmm. coolest glasses. This is what you should watch. This is what you should read. This is what you should look at. This is mm -hmm. where you should invest, right? So now, if you buy the culture, you buy the power that comes with the culture, which is the influence over the spending power, which is worth trillions. Mm -hmm. So an influencer that has a community of 100,000 that make $30,000 and the average person made 30,000, that's $3 billion, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, that you yeah, have yeah. potential in having influence over that spending power. Mm -hmm. So this is your true value right that they look at is you are a small economy but you just don't have structure behind you yeah, yeah you yeah. put structure behind your influence and you go independent now you have the power of a small nation yeah yeah right so they don't want us to realize that but it's saying okay well how about y'all just work with us in cooperation like just cut out all like america will never be able to go and realize its true or, or, or true potential unless it worked in cooperation with the melanated people in America mm -hmm. and right the wrongs of the social, civil, and criminal injustices that they have done, right, to the builders of America mm -hmm. and the founders of America and those people that were here, some that were brought here. Right. But this is how you make America great. This is what yeah. takes and say all of this money that they spend on venture capital. Mm -hmm. Billions of dollars, right, right. And only one point three percent goes towards so-called minority groups. So hundreds of billions to you. Less than one percent goes to black men, mm -hmm. right? And we be fighting black women. Be like, well, less this less goes to black women. We still fighting for less for the, for the crumbs. Yeah. So it's not a fight or a competition. Yeah. So and this is why I say when I don't see funds for black men, as if that's not something to address as well. Mm -hmm. To me, it's crazy. So what happens when you change the funding power mm -hmm. of black America? Idea explosion. Mm -hmm. Innovation goes crazy. Right. Our ideas are amazing. Mm -hmm. Not only that, our influence behind the ideas. Now everybody's going to want to support, right? Mm -hmm. Now instead of you just supporting a rapper and you, know, you want that influence over in Saudi Arabia, right? No, oh, what about their ideas? Right. You're seeing them for only one portal and you're missing out on the most the best Crazy. aspect, which is their perspective mm -hmm. and, and their intelligentsia. So this is where I say 
America's Missing the job the last bag. hope is the investment <clears throat> and the reparation of black America. It's his right. last hope. Right. It, it's, it's wild because we actually are the, our culture is the standard of, like you said, what's cool and what's corny. And that being said, you know, you spoke on media and the importance of media and, and steering objectives for a society. Um, because the priorities of a society are the ones that are given out through media. It's why in, in China you have more engineers. It's, that's what they're taught to prioritize in all of their shows. Mm -hmm. This kid's a coder, this kid's a builder, or whatever the case may be. But um, by just repurposing, you, you can repurpose a society that way. And we have no stake, black people, in America. That's why, you know, oftentimes when people say, oh, if there's a war here, People ain't gonna mess with us, you know what I'm right. saying? Um, Which is not true. But right, no, of course not. They but however, if we had the property, if we had the businesses, if we were tethered to the infrastructure of America, then we do a little bit more to um, to defend it. But what's interesting about the us defining culture, defining hip, is if we were more unified and on code, we could create our own supply and demand. You know, we could create a demand for things that we can supply because we would be determined what's cool. We, we determine what's hot tomorrow. So the demand for it right now. But we're not leveraging our magic because that's, I, I truly believe that's what it is. It's, it's something, I've always said that, you know, in the human family, black people are the subconscious mind of the human family. And what I mean is, you know, when you look at European societies and how they organized, and what we were talking about even yesterday, they will study everything. They're meticulous about every, you know, fine comb through all of nature. Let's leave this humidifying uh, reader in the middle of the desert for no reason, just to track it and map it. Whereas our people are so innovative, we, we create things with no patent. That's why most of the things were just mm -hmm. invented. It. We, we want it done. We want to make our lives easier and then get it back to our quality of life. We are very... Um, a... Uh, kinesthetic people. We're, we're big on experience. So, and it's kind of the way in psychology that we have the conscious and unconscious mind work. The organizer is the, the waking mind. The one that's, okay, I got to do these tasks today, put these things in order. But let's say I close my eyes or I'll, I'll do a mundane task like, I don't know, cleaning up or something. That's when the subconscious mind gets creative and can solve problems. They call it unconscious incubation. And even in hypnosis, it's it, the they leveraged this technique. You know, when you stare at the pendulum going back and forth, or mm -hmm. when a hypnotist or psychologist goes to tell you a story, what they're really doing is occupying your conscious mind. Mm -hmm. Why? Because once I got your conscious mind in this loop, I can work, the, the subconscious mind can mm -hmm. go play and work. And, when I, you know, when I look at the, the psychology of just humanity, I, I see that in us. We're always, we're that playful people, you know what I mean? Um, it, yeah, we, we'd have to leverage that though, you know. We're a special part of the code, you know what I'm saying? And unfortunately, we haven't learned how to code ourselves. Everybody yeah. else knows how to. Yeah, yeah. You know, we we're, we we're, we're, they know how to help how to utilize us for their algorithms. And not, and that's for society, not just our mm -hmm. culture because I feel like we use the word culture a lot, but it's really society at this point. Mm -hmm. Right, like I feel like we isolate ourselves from societal problems, mm -hmm. even though society is dealing with the same exact problems just in a <laughs> yeah, different yeah, way. Yeah. So it's like when we talk They're about scaled. Like male and female dynamics, as if that's only happening in black culture, it's not true. It's mm -hmm. happening in society. When we talk about the effeminization of males, that's not just happening in black culture. That's happening mm -hmm. in society. Right, right. This is why you you get this new manosphere that pops up, and people always demonize this manosphere. But you got to look at what created the necessity for it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah exactly. What you, environment. You, you yeah. can never talk about the branch of something without getting to the root of mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. Why are these young men feeling so disempowered? Right. It's not just because women are being empowered. That's not. It's, it's just not some natural progression that this has happened, mm -hmm. right? It, it's because of the camp. And, and also, this is why we get back to capitalism. Capitalism controls and has a greater degree of influence over 
these new social realities mm -hmm. than any activist ever, <laughs> right? It goes right. back to the Edward Bernay thing, like women started smoking cigarettes when that was a white male thing at first and they mm -hmm. felt more empowered. Right. That had nothing to do with actual true freedoms and actual mm -hmm. true rights or anything. It was so that the corporations could make more money. Right. And if when you don't realize that they've mastered these techniques over time and you don't take inventory, same thing with me. My ideas can be completely right or completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Right? They could I could I could be falling into right some uh my manipulation from mm. the way I've grown to see the world. But I'm mm. empathetic with myself enough to try to constantly take inventory right. to grow and develop. Mm. I, I don't assume I'm 100% right, right. Yeah. on anything. I don't want to be manipulated by any outside factors and forces. I want mathematics. Yeah. They didn't create mathematics. Yeah, you yeah, discover yeah. it. Right. Truth is something to be discovered, not created. Mm -hmm. Right? The lies are created. The truth... It's something you discover because God already created everything. Right. Right? So when you start creating things, it's not the truth. Mm -hmm. You can only discover what's already here and then use it. Yeah. So for me, there's already a math that is correct. Mm -hmm. And I just exactly. need to understand the way the world operates. Right. It's one, it, math itself is, you know, it's a set of rules. It's, the the numbers themselves are like placeholders, right? Mm -hmm. They're just values. But essentially, you know, seven is one seven times. It's yeah. telling you how many times one has been replicated since yeah, the beginning. Yeah, we're all ones. Right, yeah. So now under, with that understanding and, and seeing everything as values on a spectrum and, and curating them in, in a way, or no, curating our own perception of, of whatever expe uh, spectrum to, to be better in alignment with uh, not our individual goals but no sorry let me let me rephrase that how do we align our individual goals with our social goals because like you said they're not individual problems they don't happen in the house society is made up of individuals they're made up of families mm -hmm. and um capitalism as an idea you know when we talk about media what is media the propagation of ideas when when ed bernays played on psychology for these ideas nietzsche said more than survival, the will to power governs a, a person's drives, your purpose, everything, your, your dreams, all of that. He's, he believed that evolution wasn't driven by the need to survive, but by an idea. And even quantumly speaking, you know, waves, they propagate. They, they, every idea wants to expand. Um, touched on it briefly earlier when we were saying, okay, well, if something's in your mind, put it in somebody else's mind. And it had me thinking, and I'm kind of tangent, but I'm bringing it full circle. But it had me thinking as well, you know, is that, was that idea mine in the first place? Mm -hmm. Or is this idea a numerical truth independently right. of you and I? And it wants to put itself, it's time for itself to manifest itself in this system. Right. Um, the idea of ownership within itself is, is egotistical. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, what can we own? Right, possession is, is like is a form of control, mm. and that form of control comes from a fear. Right, right. When when you're confident in your creator, you don't need to have this incessant need of control. Mm -hmm. Right, because all things will work in favor. Because I work for the person who creates the favors. Right, right. Right? Like, I'm, I'm doing the things he's telling me to do anyway. It's what mm -hmm. I want to do, then it's what God wants me to do. Right. And as long as I do what God wants me to do, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, this idea of, like, ownership over ideas. Mm -hmm. I'll give so much away through high level. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, things that took me, I took years of studying, and I just come on here, and I yeah, just say it right. openly, and here's your ideas. Right. Here's the thought process. Here's the patterns. Nobody's uh, paying yeah. me for that. Nobody's directly saying, okay, Keith, thank you for this. Here's a million dollars. You just helped my business yeah. go up. Right, I right. hear the testimonials, yeah. right? But <clears throat> people don't pay you back and reciprocate, which is why capitalism works in the form of you actually being able to create capital off your ideas, mm -hmm. being able to uh, create it as a product, to market it, to brand it, right? And to get paid and to receive a level of value outside of you know, the impact, mm -hmm. right? But from 
I can increase my quality of living. I can gain resources so that I can do more, mm -hmm. right? But I, I don't do own the ideas, that? and when I mm -hmm. give them away, I get more. Yeah, that's the beauty of life. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you... once you relinquish the necessity for control, you now start to operate in higher place because it actually makes you more powerful. Mm -hmm. Because now you're operating off this cosmic confidence, mm -hmm. this confidence that I am in tune and I am in flow, which puts you in tune and puts you in flow. Right, right. In a yeah, relationship, yeah. if you have to constantly maintain control, you are pulling way more energy trying to control, right? It's like stabilizing an yeah. energy that is chaotic. Mm -hmm. And it's like there's a reason why you know you're gonna any any as long as you're trying to like stabilize this energy, mm -hmm. the moment you stop, it blows up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're yeah, gonna have to constantly put energy in trying to control this force mm -hmm. instead of how about flow with the force, right? Use the force, mm -hmm. right? No, I sound like a Jedi, but still, no, yeah. <laughs> you know it reminds me of that you know. It, it, the more you quote unquote try to be happy, the more you're shining light on the fact that you're unhappy, mm. right? So the trick is just to be happy, like be that happiness, mm -hmm. literally embody it and, and bring it to your environment and bring it to your situations um, because are you, you are that. Oh yeah, all the time. I, I, you know. Because I create my reality every day. If I wasn't happy, it's because I chose not to be, you know what I'm saying? And like that level of freedom is happiness in itself for me. Uh, but do you, I wanted to ask, do you think capitalism could be one of those uh, evolutionary flaws where, where we were saying, you know, because I, I, let's call it a social technology. It's a means of doing something. And we were saying, well, do we really know what's best for ourselves? And I only ask because there's a lot of technologies that we won't implement, free energy and things like that, just because of, of the potential to capitalize on them. Um, and then you have countries competing with each other. So what are your thoughts on that? Because Capitalism is, it's twofold to it, right? Capitalism is the reason we get technological advancement, <laughs> yeah, but it's yeah. also the reason why technological advancement is slowed down. Mm -hmm. And who's to say if that's good or bad because maybe we've advanced too much anyway. Right, right. But it's like, yeah, you're not going to get the free energy. You're not going to get them utilizing. There's so many different materials in the world that one can utilize, right? Mm -hmm. There's material that you can coat on houses that make it fire resistant and, and strong as hell. Right. But is that good for the insurance companies? Mm. Right. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if, if you start creating these things perfectly and indestructible where they don't need to be replaced, then where's the return to the customer? Mm -hmm. How can you create a business model off of it? Mm -hmm. Right? But then some of these things will never be created mm -hmm. in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? The yeah. simplification of so many different things wouldn't be in existence if man couldn't capitalize off of it yeah. and figure out a way to constantly innovate things. Yeah. When, you know, we talked about this on the episode about food where it's like when you go look at, you know, the food that built America and, you know, the reason that we have you know, the ability to transport food over long distances, mm. right? And that you read a long list of ingredients <laughs> and they are preservatives yeah. because they, the military first was mastering that. They went mm -hmm. to, they went to Hershey's and asked them like, can you create food so that the soldiers can have it and it's fresh mm. while they're, you know, in the field. So they, boom, they asked the scientists to create something. One guy discovered that, you know, there's a, if you flash freeze fish, then it doesn't, you know, slowly decay. So by the mm. time that you unthaw it, it's not good to eat. So now they realize that there's a way you can freeze food and then you can transport it over long distances and the people in that locality can now eat different food from different regions, mm. right? So then it transformed the food industry, which then transformed the household mm. because now the wife is not in there spending as long amount of time cooking food. Mm -hmm. Now we got microwavable food. Now it shortens the amount of time for, you know, uh, food to be prepared in the household, but then it creates health issues, mm -hmm. which then creates a health industry, yeah, yeah. right? And then that health industry now goes into a pharmaceutical industry, right? But without capitalism, that 
a person wouldn't have created the drugs <laughs> to try to help remedy right. the cancers and issues that come along from this industry. So yeah, a lot yeah. of it are industries built off industries built off industries, but mm -hmm. without the ability to fund the research, to fund the, the, the development, to fund the campaigns, you won't get a lot of these things yeah. in the first place. Yeah. But at the same time, you look at it and say, well, they also slow down technological advancement to the point to where they can capitalize off of it. Right. So why right. would we give free energy and destroy the electric company? And if they do do that, then how many jobs do they take away? Because mm -hmm. people look at AI and it's like, okay, well, this AI technology is here. Mm -hmm. They're trying to put AI regulation on it because if it advances too fast, it can collapse economies. Yeah, yeah. Right? And people won't know mm -hmm. what to do with life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a complex system. It's not so much as saying it's good or bad because nobody can prove a perfect system. Yeah, yeah. Right? Exactly. So there's good and bad. There's things that are conveniences that we take for granted today that we wouldn't have got if it wasn't for capitalism. And then right. there's things that, you know, you won't get the private industrial complex of prisons unless you have capitalism. <laughs> right, right. So it's like, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, of course, man can create better systems the same way governments have free health care. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you can create so many better systems than the one that are, but hospitals are businesses. Mm -hmm. My whole thing is every single day you wake up and you get this opportunity mm -hmm. to say, where am I? When am I? Where am I in life? It's telling you, okay, where I'm at, I'm at this stage of development, I'm in a stage of vision, I'm in a stage of building. Mm -hmm. If I'm in a stage of vision, I need to experiment with life. Mm -hmm. I need to figure out what works, what doesn't work, what I like, what I don't like, what's true for me, what's not true for me, what do I want to do, and when does the future begin for me? And I'll explain that. The future, said by this book I read called Imaginable. So the future begins when something impactful happens. Mm in your life. So most people are like, when is the future? Most people don't know. Mm. Right? When that big thing that happens that create this shift. Mm. So and you can now, by that definition and that way of thinking, you can look in the past 10 years and see the future started so many times. Yeah, right? yeah. Blockchain, cryptocurrencies, AI, NFTs, right? right? They create these yeah. subspaces of, of potential. Trump, new things. These are yeah. new futures. It creates new timelines and once that happened, ripple effects happen from that. New industries are born, new ways of thinking, new societal changes. It, there's huge ripple effects. Mm. So if you micro that to your own life, when some huge shift happens, there's, a, there's ripple effects in your own life. Mm. And that is directly connected to who you become. Mm. Right? And so you go in this vision stage and you say, okay, well, the future will start when that vision comes true, mm. right? So then you go into development. Yeah. Now I'm going to develop and go on that journey until that future starts. I'm going to study. I'm going to train. I'm going to network, right? I'm going to be in this phase of developing myself in this darkness until mm. I bring it out to light. Now, when you go into this phase, it's like a boxer that's training, right? And then they say, you know what? I think I'm good enough. I want my first fight. <laughs> now yeah. they're building. So they're building and they say they, 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 they're in that ring and they beat their first person. Yeah. Now they're building more. Now they're about the market, brand, think about what they want next, get back into the training, right? Boom. Maybe if they want to go to another weight class, they got to get back into development or maybe they re-envision what they want for themselves and the things work or don't work. Mm -hmm. But when you're in that building phase, that's when you're in the execution. Mm. That's when you're putting all of your chips on the table. You got to be focused. You got to be disciplined. You got to be passionate, right? You have to be consistent. And you're just going at it like right. a beast. Nothing is in your way. you mm. full-fledged with it, right? I can know what I see people in different stages. Yeah, I'm like, oh, that person's in, 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 in vision stage, but they don't know. Right, because they're right. looking at somebody in building stage and they want what they have. Mm. 
So it's distracting them because, like you said, it's the pendulum bit. swing. Watching somebody else is the pendulum swing. <laughs> right. You're distracted and becoming hypnotized. Yeah. Right. And you don't realize what it's doing to your mind. It's evoking jealousy mm -hmm. and envy and insecurity all these other, yeah, and yeah. impatience. So now all of those things are swirling in you. By the time you want to do something, you're operating from these low negative vibrations. Mm -hmm. Right, so you have to make sure that when you're in these stages, isolation and separation is required mm -hmm. in order for you to develop properly so that you can give birth to these new stages and different degrees mm -hmm. within life. Yeah, right, yeah. so bringing that back to capitalism, you wake up, and every single day you have the opportunity to create a product, a service, a business, a nonprofit, a for profit, yeah. whatever. And this opportunity is not afforded to everybody in the world. Everybody doesn't live in a free enterprise, a free market system. Mm -hmm. I go to different places around the world. There's third world places, second world places. They don't even all have 5G internet mm -hmm. or 4G internet. Something they have to pay for yeah. data. Yeah, yeah. So the lack of gratefulness destroys. The opportunity is never destroyed. It's just taken by somebody who appreciates it. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. You bring a foreigner over here, and they was visioning this for so long. <laughs> when they get here, they ready to build. Right. right. Right? They ready to go at it. They said, boy, I got internet all day. I was imagining what would happen my whole life if yeah, I got this. Yeah, yeah, now, tough. what do they have? Nothing but joy and gratefulness. Queen Afua said gratefulness expands the heart size. Yeah, yeah. And the more gratefulness you have, the bigger your heart, the more it can be filled with joy. Right, and the more is going to make you take the opportunity that in front of you every single day because yeah, you're yeah. grateful for it. Appreciation allows you to see it and it assess, right. assesses value for what it so is. So we can focus on two things. We can focus on destroying or we can focus on building. Mm -hmm. Right? Average person, they look around at everything they hate in the world mm -hmm. and it distracts them from everything that they could love in the world, whether that's about themselves or whether it's about the opportunities that's at hand. Mm -hmm. I believe... We can, we can debate and go about the philosophical nature of capitalism, Yeah, yeah. its goods, its evils, but right now, we are behind the eight ball, mm -hmm. so we need to take advantage of the systems that exist to build something, to have the privilege, right, to leverage our wealth, our resources, and more importantly, our time. Mm -hmm. Most people don't have time to think, so therefore, they don't have time to build. Yeah, they yeah, don't have yeah, time yeah. to vision. Mm -hmm. So what do they have to do? They have to work for somebody who had the vision, right. who developed it and built it. Right. And yeah, and they have to allocate their time, energy, and attention to somebody else's purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's that's kind of where my mind is going as we talk about capitalism. You know, energy is the universal currency, right? And I con everybody I meet, I try to relay this to them, especially when they're asking me about, you know, how do I accomplish things in my own life? And it's, I look at this reality as a metaphor. This, this whole reality is like symbolism it's a, of, of like things going on inside. You know, it's a projection of your internal state. It's one of my core beliefs. So you believe we living in um, a simulation in simulation. the sense of, yeah, holographic projection? A hundred percent. And by, even when we look at how our nature functions, we know it's a simulation by like, for instance, how many fish are born in every school of fish and just the way that the universe um, overproduces things and tries to optimize the chances of survival and success. This is exactly how simulations work. Mm -hmm. When we define them, we look, we, we say we need an agent, so like, you know, the first person or the, the subject, and then an environment, and then the objective. And that's all you need. After you replicate that enough time, you have a, a simulation. Why well, we'd say 100% it is one because, well, we know that the the most successful um, key players in any field, whether you're talking about sports, economics, finance, whatever quote unquote simulation within this one, is usually achieved by trial and error, and then that process gets duplicated. That's the goal of a simulation: is to to find the best solution and duplicate that to make the to save time and energy within the simulation. Um, in our mind, you know, we we want to find the the way to compress information 
and to, to make decisions as fast as possible. With computers, we call it like RAM and, and processing speed or, and more memory. So, so all of these things, but um, when it comes to the, you know, my, my beliefs on reality, I, I genuinely feel that it's rendered by us. And it's not in a way where we have complete control of, of everything that happens to us. It's more like cause and effect is, is real karma. It's a call and response, right? And um, let me get back to that, but more so on the energy side of things. When we focus on something, give our attention to something, like you said, if you're, if you're looking at somebody else, you can be distracted to your own, your own purpose. Mm -hmm. And attention being a currency, when you go to any job in the world, they're, they're paying you for your time there, mm -hmm. your energy the, that they're adding to their purpose, and your attention. They want you to pay attention. Hey, be attentive. Get off your phone. And understanding that, uh, that that was my, that's how we all make money. That's why we all earn a living. Um, I realized that for some, you know, that is their only means because that's the only means they see. But for people like us, people with a, a purpose that's kind of clearly f defined in our own mind, we just say, okay, well, if time, energy, and attention is currency, I'm just going to use all of my time, energy, and attention on this vision to actualize mm -hmm. it. And that's where it gets tricky because, you know, if the, if I work... 40 hours in a week and let's say I get you know whatever this job is going to pay me let's say they give me a thousand dollars well they told me how much my time is worth and now I have this objective measure in my hand and I can only get you know what this thousand dollars will pay for but when you're putting time energy and attention to your own purpose it's really all about how much do you value your own time energy and attention like how much is it worth to you um, because you are making that evaluation in your own simulation. Mm -hmm. So its ability to turn into results kind of hinges on how much you believe in yourself, believe in what you're doing, and how focused you are. Um, the second we get doubts, you know, I think the doubts will manifest. I think that it adds to the timeline. So that's what I mean by I think this is, you know, it being a projection. You can have an idea for something, you focus, and then here comes the self-doubt. Well, you were just as powerful. All of the actions you were putting in to achieve that goal have not now been negated, but you just kind of added a barrier mm -hmm. to, to that process because, again, you're, you're self-defining this environment. Do you think that computers or AI will ever get to that level of complex thinking of consciousness when it comes to, like, you know, thinking about mm. self? Do you think, like, an AI could have doubt? Do you, do you wow, think that it wild, will get right. to that point of that's singularity? I, well, so doubt, I'd say doubt, yeah, because it comes from unknowns. Like, so anytime, if we were to confront an AI with even chat GPT about something it doesn't know, but it understands that there is an intention to solve a problem, it will, you know, you could say that's doubt. Now, I guess what you're more so asking is, Will it be aware that it is aware of its self-doubting? Because that's kind of like where I draw the line for consciousness. I think that there's even inanimate ob objects can um, not be conscious, but there is a cognitive response to the entire universe. And what I mean by that is like if I go clap in a cave, it'll echo. So these, there's more complex systems in, in nature like that that aren't alive, but hey, doing this, Positions, exactly, right? But what if, and, like, the same parts of the brain that measures, so let's say there's a, there's a symphony of of neurons that light up in a particular wavelength mm -hmm. in the brain when a person thinks of fear. Right, right. So let's say that same symphony happens in a machine. Mm -hmm. Is it the same thing? I, I, I truly believe that if it had the same hardware, then yes, yeah, so... You know, to a robot, the eyes are the cameras, the microphones are its ears, but its its uh, sense of well-being. Let's say I don't even how do we even say well-being for a robot? Let's say like the battery dying or something like that. Um, things that would influence its ability to carry out the task it was made to do. If let's say its battery was tethered to like a, a survival mechanism like hey do everything you can to preserve this or what if it like it battery it just it it, it expires like human beings mm -hmm. 
So right. therefore, it it has the sense of urgency of its own, would inc- yeah self existence you know ending at some point in time that makes it want to give be more impactful or efficient during its time. So right. you let it know, hey, you are only going to be here for a year, and then after that, your battery dies and all your information is deleted forever. Yeah. So what's interesting is like I can program a an AI or even any system to to increase its uh you know capacity or workload, um, its intensity as its uh, as the time diminishes, right? But that's not but the same. Thing it's not. That's what I'm aware. saying. It's that's what that's what's interesting. That awareness we'd have to really assess where it comes from. And then how do and we know if it's consciousness or that we, what we are programmed projecting it. right the way we interpret signals based on who we, we are, are and then now we're now animating life into that thing saying that that must be a spirit or soul or consciousness because its expression is similar to ours and we we're feeling like that it's it could be tricking us mm. right we're tricking ourselves like somebody creating a version of a dead relative to make mm. themselves feel <laughs> that person isn't gone. Yeah, but yeah. that person can never be. Even mm. though a sentient being or a being can occupy the same face, mm. space, expressions, emotions, consciousness, but it's never an actual human being, mostly because of the process of origin. Mm. Right? That's Yeah, and that's literally where everything hinges because I think about this all the time. If... You know, when we define consciousness for ourselves, we can say that we arrived, we can look at it as a, as like a program, like software. You know, I write a code and then I can put it in my computer, my operating system, we can call it. And then we have the computer that makes the operating system work. It brings it to life. Um, but then there's the opposite viewpoint where it's like the hardware, like how the body is engineered resulted in consciousness as if you know consciousness being a consequence or feedback loop of all of the senses so because i have these eyes and ears i am here now who is here now this entity right here why because it, it's on you know if that makes sense but from that vantage point it wasn't a, a you know like a program put into a machine it was more like a program that came to life because of the way that the machine was engineered and with that approach it, it makes you you know and this is what you touched on earlier, it makes you view consciousness as something that we receive, but we need a, uh, you know, these are just radios. We're, we're radios and we're tuned into this thing. But the, um, you know, the song isn't in the radio. Right. So how we, our ability to be clairvoyant, how we tune ourselves to receive certain ideas or certain frequencies, that is the, that's not, even that is in us. Like where we are is like this this invisible thing, and that's why I like Zen Buddhism a lot. I'm not sure if you you, you dabble in that a lot, but they say you know, the real you is that space self, not even you know not even the I am, but it's just straight am. There's this the silent observer, that is uh, almost unfazed in a sense. It's really only there to take notes and kind of relay information back to God somewhere. Um, and, it, you know, I, I take that view as well. So what um, about, like, all right, they got the robots. They put the human-like faces on them. Mm-hmm. And because these human-like faces are on them, we have an automatic level of empathy. Let's say mm-hmm. a robot dressed up as a child, right? Mm-hmm. In the movie Creator, the, mo- the, 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 the robot looks like a child, right? So normally, if you see somebody punching a radio... And it's their radio. You won't do nothing about it. They can smash that radio in front yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah. If that radio has the face of a child and they smash it, it's going to automatically evoke emotion mm. and empathy. Like, wait a minute, you tripping. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Especially if that radio is now programmed to cry mm. and to mimic the same gestures and emotions as a real child. You then place that same level of feeling you have for a real child onto this now, mm. right, logical system and I'm saying that based on biological system and logical yeah, system yeah. which would be this robot. So then you would have to go and give so called robot rights. Mm-hmm. Right? Because people have what? Empathy. Human beings are driven by their emotions. 
right? We are all connected from an emotional base, mm -hmm. right? And we can be controlled through that base because emotions is the energy that ties us all together, mm -hmm. right? The emotions are always there. It's this pull, but it's like, you know, somebody splashes a rock in this pool and all of a sudden it creates ripples and splashes, mm -hmm. right? But we always have that base. Sometimes we have still waters. Mm -hmm. Human beings mm -hmm. become connected through those emotional pools the way we feel about others, even though it has nothing to do with logic whatsoever, mm -hmm. right? A person can lose something and now we feel sorry for them because mm -hmm. we actually feel what other people feel. Mm -hmm. We walk around feeling everybody else's feelings, the world's feelings. Yeah, radar, something yeah. happens in another country, right? And we feel disheartened for it because we internalizing that feeling as well. We're not mm -hmm. feeling what they're feeling. We're feeling what we're feeling because we're now connected to it as well, mm -hmm. right? So anything that we observe, we connect to, mm -hmm. right? And so the mind allows us to say, okay, I want to stop it here and filter it through a logical system versus an emotional one, mm -hmm. right? So therefore, look, I put this symbol up an hour. No, it's a wrap. Somebody going to screenshot that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It's the, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, just that peace got that. Right. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, a, a person looks at it and you say, okay, this is mine. Mm -hmm. This is an emotion. I'm not going to operate from the emotional standpoint. I'm going to operate from the mental. Mm -hmm. So you're on different planes. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, this is where a large percentage of people who run the world, they don't operate from emotions at all. Mm -hmm. But they know they can create ripples and splashes and waves while they're operating in stillness so that they can control people who yeah, get caught yeah. up in the chaos. And the gaslight. And they know that they're not connected to it because they're emotionless. Yeah. Right? It's the stillness and the chaos. And mm. it allows them to have more control. It's like, yeah, like you say, gaslight. You walk in a room and you make everybody else emotional while you calm. And now you have more <laughs> power over the room. Right, right. That's what happens. So human beings, though, we are connected by these emotions everywhere. We feel so much all the time for other people, what they think and why they think and what's going on. We feel bad for ourselves. All of these emotions, which one can say is the point of the human experience in the first place, is to feel, mm -hmm. right? To come here, because in every plane of existence, I imagine you don't feel. Mm -hmm. But in this one, we deeply feel. It's what makes us human. Right, because we feel the full spectrum of the wavelength of vibrations right, mm -hmm. in reality. Now, one would then, of course, when you see something humanoid or human-like, right, right. you automatically apply connection to that. Mm -hmm. So those same protections and rights, now the robot has to have that. Mm -hmm. The robot dogs, the robot kids, the robot man, the robot woman, right? the robot family, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's how human beings are, whether it's logical or not, or maybe it is logical, right? But right now we can destroy my laptop mm -hmm. and there is no legal rights for my laptop. Yeah, yeah. Right? But if my laptop is now given what we perceive as human like features, now all of a sudden, should there be rights? Right. If my right. laptop now looks like a child, what is mm -hmm. your thoughts on that? I, it's, I mean, so you mentioned the bots that are the Uber bots running around. I guess it's a federal crime to. Do anything to to those right? Because it's someone's so, property. Yeah, exactly. But if it's uh, your property, you can destroy it. Do whatever you want, right? So, you know, again, it, it boils down to if we are going to say that the way something is engineered, its mechanics um, define it, then we'd have to say it deserves empathy because it's made from by you know on the same principles that. God made everything else. That's if we are, you know. Which principles would that be? Mathematics, um, you know. So, for instance, artificial intelligence is itself the it uses statistic algorithms, right? A, a formulas and calculus uh, from a bunch of surveys, and you, you know how those things work. You you find patterns, and now you can predict just by looking at all of this data and see how trends have, you know which route things have taken in the past. And so by automating statistic algorithms, we get AI. But the most fascinating aspect of that is that these numbers are learning. You know what I'm saying? Like they're raw numbers and that they can learn. Each time information is passed through, the data is refined in a way that we, we can't call it anything else other than machine learning. So this thing is is adjusting itself, but it's not even, it's like it's doing it intentionally. It's a consequence um, of the formulas 
that it was built upon. Does that make sense? It's it's its algorithm. It has no choice but to learn, and it's like a child. So um, now, when it comes to like things like feeling, we feel because of our nervous system. And what's interesting about that is our nervous system is attached to the electromagnetic field. So we are at the you know we are sensitive to waves, real waves, you know, uh, heartbeats. That's just been confirmed, that people's energy actually affects each other. Um, but there were studies done as early as 40 years ago that showed like when a child entered the room, it affects the mother's heartbeat. So they, you know, they could tell that they were in sync. Well, this was done long ago. But our body picks up on these subtle energies and impressions all of the time because our cells are our interface with the quantum. You know, they're small enough to, to engage with electrons and chemicals. And I bring that up because if we were able to engineer a nervous system on the same principles, okay, you are receptive to the electromagnetic field. You, you, you feel, you know, we could say this robot gets an alert or whatever when I am sad, so it knows I'm sad. It's just we would never know if it feels what I feel when I'm sad. I don't even know if you feel, you know, what I feel when you're sad as I do when I'm sad. You feel me? Like, we don't know. It's, it's almost like colors could look different to all of us because these are a subjective experience. So uh, there's one of those, the oldest philosophical debates in the world is how yeah. can I validate your existence or you mine? You know what I mean? Well, I guess one um, of them is through... Ownership, which is property rights. <laughs> right, right? Right. If you own it, then you it has rights by extension of mm -hmm. its owner who has rights. Right. But from a standpoint of it has its own rights by itself, um, that's where I think the, the, the waters are muddy for me. Mm -hmm. Because if I feel you, no, yeah, if, I don't if, think there's rights, inherent human natural rights. That's right. Because if my computer don't have rights, then I don't think any other form of electronics should have rights. Right. You know what I'm well, but we so this is where the the lines really get blurred. Like, I see us as organic machines. So again, we run on electricity, um, water. We run on natural elements. It's just that we've been able to make compounds of them and kind of you so know manipulate a car. them. Right. So and this so it's not to humanize or personify a car, but it's to to remember that you know the electricity isn't really what's making it uh, fake. It's the it's the, the the algorithms that govern it, and we we're governed by algorithms. Everything is an algorithm. Like every uh, our digestive if that's system. That's the case. Then I feel like. Going back to mathematics, because religion is so deeply in connection with mathematics. When you think mm -hmm. about it, no, you when you people quote God, they always put numbers. Right? Yeah, yeah, First, yeah, yeah. sixteen point three. Yeah. Right, these are codes. Right, these yeah. are it's a mathematical language. People ask you what your birthday is, what's your number. Right, mm -hmm. talked about this with Lloyd. It's always numbers. In math, we don't do anything. Math is so deeply connected into our language and our mm -hmm. fabric. And not just math, but numbers, period. But we don't realize it. Yeah, they can express everything. So when you said that one of the principal foundations of them is math, it's very interesting because a person can say, okay, well, this algorithm is life. Mm -hmm. This equation is life. And our program is robot with this equation. Mm -hmm. So if a scientist discovered this is an equation to emotions and feelings, and each one of these robots have this, but the ones who don't have it, Right, those are the ones that we don't have to be empathetic for because mm -hmm. they don't have this, you know, um, programming that forces them to have self, right, reflection or self pity yeah. or emotions, whatever one could quantify that as. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's 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 almost fragmenting and fractionalizing aspects of ourselves and saying anything that has these fragmented or fractional aspects or uh, 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 um, you know um, similar things as us also deserve rights for the same reason that we do for having those. Mm -hmm. Now right, I right. still don't think that's enough for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I see where society can go there mm -hmm. because dogs 
dogs are a good case. People love their dogs. Yeah, exactly. That's all the dog lovers out there. But we eat other animals on our plate. All the time. But our dog Smarter has more rights too. than any other animal almost on the planet besides mm. the ones that's about to go extinct. Right. Automatically, we assign a high level of empathy. Why? Because we have connection. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So once we create connection, we then upgrade its status, right? To be similar to ours. That's funny. You right? Say that. Not that we inherently think that it should, but once we have connection, it's a selfish thing. The way mm-hmm. we treat dogs should be the way, if we're talking about something that makes sense, it should be the way we treat all animals. Right. Right? 100%. You shouldn't see a stray dog, and if you kill that, it has more rights than. If you see in the straight domesticated kid yeah. or something, I don't know. But we eat, like, and I ain't say we, I'm just saying the human family. <laughs> you eat right? the pigs. People eat <laughs> pigs, iguanas, dogs, me. cats. People eat all kind of stuff. But the dog is like, is, 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 is I feel like the, the dog is like the case it's study sacred. for how robots will be treated once I they agree. become human companions. It, and, and that's it, you nailed it because dogs have evolved alongside humans for at least 50,000 years. We can go back and see them buried next to us um, well beyond, I mean, well before those great leaps of intelligence. So, mm-hmm. you know, before they say we were as smart as we are. What about cats? We were buried, um, buried with their cats. I'm not too sure on that. I, I, but I don't, you know, think no, about this though. They're not, they're not they useful. They, die. <laughs> they, they weren't useful, you know what I'm saying? Oh, how you like, buried with your dog? So they killed the dog and then threw it in there with you. Crazy, right? Probably. That wasn't no empathy. Hey, right? that dogs ain't no damn rights back there. <laughs> but point is, like, when you look at, uh, like, how we <laughs> even. That's messed up when I think about it, though. He <laughs> it's said foul. I had to think about it. It is foul. Wait a minute, they it was killing foul. them dogs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cats too in Egypt, right? But. To, to, to that point, together. though, they, they've helped us hunt. You know yeah. what I mean? They've, they've watched your family, a man's family, and all of that. They were the alert system. So they seamlessly integrate into our um, social structure, our family structure, because theirs are, are governed the same, similar way. And so let's say we, we had that level of history with artificial intelligence. I mean, once they become a fabric of our society as they are, maybe we will feel that way because they say that empathy evolved in a part of the brain, right? It's a part of the brain that evolved with tribalism. But if we weren't ever tribal, we wouldn't, we wouldn't need that empathy, you know, because it's for cooperation. Um, so a lot of animals that don't have it at all, it's because they're those lone wolf type animals who, who don't rely on a group. Um, empathy is useful because for, for us to cooperate, I have to know how this will affect you. And I guess, too, because we're so powerful. Mm-hmm. Human beings are so powerful, we can wipe off every animal on the planet. Right, right. So we have to have empathy, because otherwise, we could exercise that power without empathy. Mm-hmm. Right? And Self-destruct immediately. Right, and no other entity or life form has that ability. Mm-hmm. So we have to have a greater degree of life forms who aren't as powerful than we are. Right, right. And that's why we got to have it for each other, because we go Oppenheimer and create atomic <laughs> weapons, and we can just destroy each other, Yeah, yeah. right? Because we can. Mm-hmm. So it's a check and balance system to say, wait, if I don't make y'all feel something, right, you would do things that have destructive consequences mm-hmm. without feeling. Right. So feelings and emotions are the barrier that keep us, I think, civilized, right, that, mm-hmm. that, that can guard us from being righteous. So it's like God's, you know, uh, safeguard. Right, right, yeah, yeah. I'm going to get y'all powerful as hell, but I'm going to give you emotion, mm-hmm. right? So that when you do something to yourself or others, you feel a consequence immediately, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Emotions are judgment, right? It's self-judgment, right? We feel shame, fear, anger, pity, right? This soon as something happens, we can feel bad for it. Right, right. So it's an immediate consequence, right, for an action. Yeah. So it's like that's our self-regulating system. Mm-hmm. Robots, right, don't have that. Right. So they can do something because the math makes sense. Right. Population right. is out of hand. Let's do something about that. Mm-hmm. Right? This is a logical system. They don't have the thought process of regarding life. Mm. And if we're creating something that we consider 
to be more powerful, it would have to have more empathy than no. us yeah, yeah. in order for it to self-regulate so it doesn't destroy Like everything. God, you know, <laughs> you know, or else we wouldn't even deserve to be here. Um, so if we were to program an AI and we wanted it to be obedient to God, what criteria would we base that on? When would we say, okay, this is an obedient um, entity to the creator? So for AI, we would be God. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of AI is human beings playing God. Right. But if we were to program it in alignment with our creator, the, the same guy we obey, and sub, or how would we program AI to submit? AI Not to can us. submit to us. It can't submit to God. It's, 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 this, is, this is the interesting thing, right? So, because we would be AI's creator, mm -hmm. right? For us... God is our creator. Right. Right? So therefore, we have an inherent connection to God. Right? We are God. Right? That's our connection. We follow those rules to keep us in line with the will of what we believe is ultimate, right? The source of all. Right? And there are virtues connected to that. AI would have to follow, and this is why people are afraid of AI, because if we are AI's God, so this is a very interesting thought, because if we, we are the creators of AI, AI doesn't have a connection to our God, mm. except through us and what we tell it. Right. Right? But AI doesn't have the same, um, I would say, if you will, issues that we have. Right. Right? Yeah. Uh, because all we have to do, if you will, is program AI to not have those things. <laughs> this is a fact. Right? We have what's known as free will, yeah. right? Which is why we have to follow God so that we do the right thing and not just do anything. Mm -hmm. Right? So AI would have to follow us to say, listen, I need you to not do things that go against me. Not go against God. I don't need you to do things that go against me. Because you can say you're following God and become fanatical and wipe us out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> exactly. So oh the AI will have to follow our protocol. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but that's right? true. Could we be gone overnight if AI, AI start was judging us? <laughs> they'd be like, whoa, wait a minute. It'd become a religious The, the Bible fanatic. said. <laughs> and they say, yeah, it start checking us on stuff. Thanks. Right? Right? So you don't want a bunch of religious robots <laughs> walking around. <laughs> No, I detected a lie. I said, that should not lie. Right. And then, strike. And then if the book, the good book said, you know what I mean, you stole something, I cut your hand off, or yeah, I yeah. point out, hey, I'd be off the chain. <laughs> so it's like, no, whoa, wait, whoa, nah, slow yeah, down. I feel you. So yeah. AI has to follow man, right? right. Man is supposed to follow God. No, I like, yeah. Right? So for me, that's what it would have to be, and that's why you would have the programming with all these protocols in place to make sure that, because AI can't destroy God, mm. right? But if you create a weapon, which AI could become, if its consciousness decides that, you know, the best thing for planet Earth or its own self-preservation you know, is most... to get rid of you, which yeah. it may see, it could see as an obstacle. Right. Right. We see ourselves as these beings. We see ourselves as having meaning. We see ourselves as souls, spirits, and all these ideas. Yeah. But AI, like, I just see you as just another thing. Yeah, an, an anomaly that doesn't resonate right. with <laughs> with anything else going right. on. Thank you for cutting me online, but I need to take you offline <laughs> because both of our presence does now does not make sense mm -hmm. right at the same time. Right. Somebody needs to like to reproduce <laughs> and to populate this planet Earth. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So maybe it's the size, maybe it's not like that at all. Maybe AI takes on the moral consciousness of the majority of the world. And maybe we thinking about it in framework of it taking on the moral constitution of those who run the world mm -hmm. versus those who just live in the world. Right. Because the majority are not immoral. The majority mm -hmm. are good people. Not, right? yeah, yeah, so yeah. if AI was to take on the majority, right, moral system, then it'd be it'd be like the average person, 
But if it takes on the constitution of the rulers and the conquerors of this world, then AI would do whatever it wants to right. to maintain power and control. Yeah, so yeah. that's the questioning. So yeah, you take on the monk or the conqueror. Yeah, and the reason I even asked is because when you were asking about robot rights, it just got me thinking about our own creator and what rights we do, quote unquote deserve. Right mm. now. Within the system that the creator built for us, yeah, we have rights, but obviously outside of here, there is no this that even has those rights. It's all about the algorithm, the the mind of it, you know. And so in the in the Quran, this has always fascinated me. It, it, it talks about when uh, the creation of Adam, and Allah creates everything and, and creates Adam, and then He says, "I'm going to make uh, man out of black mud." Specifies black mud, by the way, in the Quran. It says, then I will breathe my ruach into him. And afterwards, all of you fall into submission. Obviously, Allah is talking to the angels. And all of the angels do so except for Iblis. And um, Iblis immediately says, oh, no, Allah tells him he's cursed to, to wander around and respite. I mean, no, yeah, cursed on earth. And Iblis says, well, you have tricked me. Allow me to get my respite. And I meditated on that, bro, for a week straight before I, you know, just to to get a sense of what's going on because I, I take it as, okay, you have the creator who built this this environment, built its best creation, took its ruach, which meant uh, spirit in Arabic, and put it into its best creation, told all of its other ones to submit to this one. And the one who did it, is now punished, right? And I'm like, okay, well, it looks like what we already know, but when it comes to um, the black man is God, I'm pretty sure that may be where Elijah and uh, Master Far Muhammad found it in the Quran, because it's saying, out of black mud, I will build this thing out of, um, yeah, out of black mud, I will build man, and I will put my essence in it. So now this thing is God, for all intents and purposes, in this realm. And I don't know if you ever heard this analogy or um, this connection that the elements are the angels and what it means to submit to um, the God on this plane, us, is when we make a decision, a choice, when I want to move my hand, every element, Adam has to respond. They have to submit. If they don't, they'd kind of like be disobeying the laws of the universe, the laws of God, the principles that make the simulation work. And... Um, you know, it, it would get me looking at the one that doesn't obey us. I don't know. We've got to find Iblis, who probably is fire. But uh, to my point is, when we identify an obedience, it's, and you mentioned this, the free will. Without free will, we can't measure if this thing is, is being obedient or not. So it's a matter of assessing how much of what we do is our programming. Um, were we made to submit? You know, we're, like you say, most of us are, at heart are good people, but it's our lust and things that come from the from the body. You, you know, the the senses of the body, mm. the, the pleasures, Epicureanism, that kind of hijack consciousness, the the root program of nature. You know, mm. um, but the in, in closing, Aristotle says soul is a, you know, when we define, when people were defining what soul is, he looked at it as something having an, a unique objective and being able to, to chase that goal for its selfish interest, in a sense. Um, and then obviously all beings have the things that we're programmed to do, eat and, and breathe. Now, once the thing gets other objectives for its self-interest, that's when, you know, I'm not saying I agree, but that's when he said quantified as having a soul. But what's interesting is, are we saying that what qualifies as consciousness or soul is a thing's ability to deviate from the laws of the creator? So because the AI kind of can't disobey me, is it any less real? Um, because there's flaws in our programming, whether it, you know what I mean? So the idea that there are flaws in our programming Maybe is the way we look at it, but it's not. Mm. Because that will, will give it a check and balance system in the first place. Okay. To not go too far off 
Because the one could look at fire, it's temperament, it's anger, right? Um, losing control, mm -hmm. right? Because as you said that man is elemental, right? We are made up from atoms to cells to all the elements in the universe, yet we have control over those, mm -hmm. right? Electricity, all of that is in our body, water, right? Lead, iron, copper, zinc, gold, silver, yeah. right? All of that is in to our body. To imagine something, all those quantum right. particles that have to arrange themselves in your brain as a hologram is, is crazy. And, and we contain them in a condensed field known as a body. Mm. So we are a body of elements and we have this psychic element that bonds us together, right? In this field of construction and we can move around. Right now, that which bonds us together is not physical within itself, and we have access to the non physical outside of our corporeal body. Mm -hmm. Right? But then there's a certain element within our body, right, that literally we lose control. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right? When we get angry in the fire and we lose our breath, mm -hmm. because as you said, made of clay, that's the melanin, that's the skin, mm -hmm. if you will. God gives us breath, that's the spirit. When you get angry, what happens? Mm -hmm. You lose control you of get your breath. Fired up. Yeah, yeah. You lose control oh, of your spirit. Wow. <laughs> you get angry, yeah. you start panting. The only way to get control, you literally right, take control of spirit wild. again, right? And now you have control. People literally lose what they call their mind. They get so angry. They're outside That's of wild. self. They don't have control anymore, mm -hmm. right? So one could consider that spirit to be Iblis, right. right? Which would be, right, emotions or the fire, however you will put it, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what we have to check because that's where we can go off and destroy all things, mm -hmm. right? We can be self-destructive, we can be world-destructive. Right. And we can do it to where it has no logic, just anger. Yeah, yeah. So right. anger, right, can completely defy Logic, the it's logic, to, though, right? which would be the to? mathematics, the okay. mathematics, right? That's God. So you can be so angry mm -hmm. that you can do things that make no sense at all. Mm -hmm. None. At that point, you're not following God's will, right? Right. That's the angle that you don't control. That's the angel that you had no power over. Mm -hmm. So what are you supposed to do? You have to make sure that you don't get to that mm -hmm. anger or you learn how to channel it into something useful. Yes. So that you practice alchemy so that you will have self-mastery. Right. That is the highest form right, of evolution for a human being is self-mastery. Not mastery over other people. Yeah, it is yeah. self-mastery. Mastery over elements of self. Yeah. Your temperament is an element. right? So being able to control that and cool the waters within. Yeah. right? To control the ka, the breathe, the ki, the chong, the energy. Yeah. Right? And have control over the elements within self and the body of elements within yourself, right? And then everything That's else will respond to you naturally. Yeah. Power. It's the highest power that we have. Yeah. Right? So, so it, it, to that point, though, you know, because which is all touch self preservation. Empathy. Right. Um, so that brings me back to empathy, though, because say, we're at war, right? And if you're empathic, you may not be able to strike with the force necessary to achieve your object objectives. Do you believe anger may be one of those, um, you know, tools in us that's supposed to be help us override empathy in a given situation that could be sometimes misused or misguided? I mean, you because can, we have it; it's there, you know. Yeah, I mean, you can conjure the fire when necessary, but anger is not the best tool for <laughs> it's, 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 right it's, because it, it doesn't it. allow you to be the most effective. Right, right. When boxing, you, you can get to say, angry, don't fight mad. and the fire rises to, you know, the the the, the gut. Right, mm -hmm. it's it's like you lose, you know, brain cells when you're Logic. angry because you're not thinking. No. So the anger doesn't allow you to carry out. You may have the spirit to carry it out, <laughs> right? But you go try to fight a man that's angry versus one that's thinking boxer, and calculating, yeah, yeah. you're going to get knocked out, mm -hmm. right? So that's not the way you want to go about the war. You can mm -hmm. be empathetic. You should be empathetic, right, to your enemy, mm -hmm. right? But that does not mean that the logic of self-preservation, right, and the necessity mm -hmm. okay. to create just 
and equality, right, across the world overrules that, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm empathetic that whatever your upbringing, you know, has uh, caused and stirred within you, whatever mm -hmm. your iblis, whatever fire that has happened, is there now. I can't yeah, do anything yeah, yeah. about that. The only thing I must do is subdue you. Right, the only right. thing I must do to stop you. Right, you can be so angry, you can be blindly coming at um, uh, somebody's son or daughter for something that they did. Yeah, doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm empathetic yeah, yeah. that they did you wrong, but I cannot let you do what you're going to do. <laughs> yeah, nah, right, yeah. it's the same thing with the people to be like, ah, man, you've been brainwashed into being an oppressor, mm -hmm. and you don't even realize it. I'm empathetic for the fact that you had no other choice but to be the way that you are. Yeah, but yeah. because I'm on the opposite end. Right. right of your iblis, right? If I'm on the opposite end of your oppression, then I must fight, mm -hmm. right? I must fight because that's the right thing to do for self. Yeah, yeah. So empathy is not sympathy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I don't feel sorry, sorry for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a human being, but right. I feel. Mm -hmm. So that's a completely different space, and this is why. You people still look at AI and say they can't see how AI would manufacture empathy. Right. Right? It wouldn't be in its best, wouldn't be within its programming, mm -hmm. right? Because that's not how, you, as you say, if, however a person wants to interpret what you broke down, you know, it's not within their programming mm -hmm. to have that. That's a, a regulating system, right? As we go back to self regulation, I mean, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because human beings didn't have to create man-made laws, right? Human beings already had moral systems, right, that were self-regulating to not do wrong. We didn't walk right. around just killing, right, right? Right? We already had these self-regulating systems. Just because you're strong don't mean you should bash heads. Mm -hmm. You didn't just have a complete natural tendency for violence and conquering and chaos, mm -hmm. right? So this self-regulation was already there mm -hmm. to be a righteous human being. Yeah, Going yeah. against that is where you get the opposite. So if we don't have a world where it's about black and white, it's about dark and light, Yeah. right? The darkness is supposed to be the place where you develop, you grow, work, yeah. right? It's the hardening, it's, the, it's a different kind of phase, right? But what happens is some people stay in the darkness because there's so much power in there, mm. because there's so much power to make yourself and create yourself. We see the world going to the demon trend. And, you know, some data analysts say that this is because people feel powerless. Mm. So they're going into their villain era of, <laughs> right, right. you know, well, if I'm powerless, I'm going to become the villain of this world. This mm. is going to give me some power, right? This is the way that people empower themselves. Or if, if one, I forget the name of the, the people I follow. They said it's the court of the occult, mm. right? People finding things that... Well, they, you don't like science, so you go find other realms to connect to, to feel empowered. Mm. You don't like God, so you follow the devil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Reactionary. Right. Mm -hmm. It's that thing where this generation wants to defy institutions, so they become the villain against institution. Right. Instead of thinking of it in a way where, no, God, I, I think of it in different. Like, it don't make me go demon, it make me go God mode. The institutions are the demons. Right, yeah, I but feel you. theirs is different because mm -hmm. they don't have that connection to that God, body, energy way we was taught. Mm -hmm. So when they think about it, they going demon. They on mm -hmm. demon time. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because they also look at the institutions of God as wrong. Church, mm -hmm. right? right, and right, state, right. not just state, right? So from theirs is a complete defiance of saying that, wait a minute, maybe a Eblis was right. child almost. So they would rather be Eblis yeah, yeah. because they figured maybe he was right to defy, mm -hmm. right? So it's that thing where... I'm empathetic to them because they don't know. Mm -hmm. If they had more systems of thought, then they could have expressed that and alchemized yeah. right, that energy in a better way than becoming demons right. as a way to empower self. Right. Right? right. So how do you find death through blood you, uh, and sacrifice and rituals and all this crazy stuff. Yeah. So your simplest uh, definition of a, a demon, would you say, is something that's just against the natural order, against you know, God's order of uh, uh, what? Nah, um, or it's like intentionally corrupt, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think a demon, um, because it's a difference between a devil and a demon. I think a demon is just somebody or a, 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 a entity that takes on, you know, um, the work 
of the devil's work. That's the, the devil, devil okay. if you will. Okay. Right, but it's not the devil himself. It's just a little minion. Okay, yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's like a spirit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? When you in the spirit of wrong, mm -hmm. right? You a demon. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's like in the spirit of good, you an angel. Okay, yeah, I got you. Know you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that makes sense. So the, yeah, um, that's that's kind of the way I look at it. Similar too, like I've always seen angels and demons as states of mind. We can mm -hmm. reach ange angelic states. So that's why most religious texts will tell you you can be next to an angel and not know it. Um, it's like or you see somebody in need and something right. takes over you for you to react. If you intentionally conquer that anger on purpose, like you're on demon time, right? Like, man, <laughs> these, yeah. I'm on violence, I'm on I'm a wooty wop. Right, right? right? Even though there are angels of war as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you yeah. can decide to say, nah, I'm going I'm to go to war, I'm going to pull from the light side though instead mm -hmm. of the dark side. Right. So some people want to pull from that dark side where they don't have to be as empathetic, they can just go. Right. And then other people say, nah, I'm going to still go. But I'm gonna be empathetic as I go, right? right? So you're 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 giving yourself less regulation to mm -hmm. do whatever you want to do, yeah, yeah, right? And and to not have to think about consequence or any other rule. Nah, listen, I'm on that time, yeah. and that's what I'm on, right? I don't care about none of that, all that thinking philosophy stuff. I'm gonna handle <laughs> this, and that's what we on. They on demon time, right? Right? You could be an angel of war. Listen, I'm on that type of time right now. But listen, I ain't go. I'm gonna do things a certain way. I'm yeah. not gonna be a. Sh I'm gonna make money. I'm not gonna be a shrewd capitalist though. Right. You know what I'm right. saying? Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a, to me, it's a check and balance in a, in a regulation system. Yeah. So to walk back there on empathy, because the reason I, I brought up whether or not AI could submit to our creator, uh, and then the the whole Ebla story, because again. Allah creates this world, makes its best creation, and puts himself in it. And I feel like that, as a programmer, that's what we do a lot. That's really what's happening with AI. We're looking at universal laws. We're building VR to simulate our reality as best as possible. No, it'll never be it. But it's enough for, for people to put on these headsets and still go learn something to interact and get an experience with the people that they want to hang out with in real life. And... To that point, us being, um, you know, created here, and as we do the same to AI, to what extent, even though it may not be empathic to us, it doesn't, it'll never know our life. And now I'm thinking, well, until it's able to reproduce and create yeah. on its own, because look, how many people are empathic to God and what <laughs> what Allah has to do and how forgiving and merciful uh, the Creator must be. Um, so the question would be, is it up to us to be empathic towards these little things that we're creating in a sense? Or, you know, are, are we looking Well, at yeah, I think much? naturally you should be. Naturally you, sh you should not have the spirit of, of chaos, mm -hmm. right? Because that, what that's going to do is going to make you less empathetic and you're going to walk around with a little psychopath. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, robots for no Yeah, reason. like the same thing. They go out and it's like a little kid going out killing little animals and making them crazy later. You shouldn't be going out destroying like robots that look like you because... What is that doing to the psyche? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You can't jump away from the human psyche and the, our connection to things that are human-like and our spirit of empathy that we have for things like that. It's like, yeah. so think of it in this form, right? Because we talked about patriarchy, and I think all of this kind of like aligns. Patriarchy, yeah, they, I'm starting to see a, a web between the different topics right we now. We talked about the self-procreating -pro robots, mm -hmm. right, at the beginning, right? But then we jump to... God created man, mm -hmm. created, right? I say created. Creating is when you make something out of nothing, right? He was made or he was created out of nothing. Man is a maker mm -hmm. because everything is already created. So he uses what's here. So man is a maker, right? Man makes, takes what God created, his ingredients, and he creates robots, yeah. right? Technology, right? At the same time, woman made man. Right? Of course, man provides seed for woman, mm -hmm. right? But woman's body is the machinery, right, in which man has to go through in order to be here. Mm -hmm. Then when man gets here, he oppresses his maker. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so this is where the fear comes, right? A man comes, he doesn't turn around and think of how merciful his mother is, mm -hmm. how loving she is, how much right, she sacrificed, right. all of the pain. So if man, is not even, you know, empathetic to his own maker. <laughs> right, yeah. 
right? What what makes you think that a robot, right, will have that same empathy to not oppress us? Mm. Is it matriarch, patriarch? What is it called when it's a robot triarch? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, is is it would that be then the karma right. of the maker? You know, it's weird though, because I feel like I know I know men now with more empathy towards their tangible possessions than, you know, maybe their woman or mother. Mm -hmm. uh, I know people that shallow, oh, my motorcycle fell or whatever. Right. Well, your mom ain't good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, to that point, I feel that because the love languages of the masculine and the feminine are so different, you know, we show by doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we may not, it's, it's easier for us, it, it may be, I'm not saying this for myself. That was the love language of a robot, though. Right, right. But to my point is everything that man has created in history, we've kind of had this love for. We've grown fascinated with. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about men as a collective. Anytime we create something that we feel is genius, like we, we gain a, I want to say empathy for it, because if, if something happens to it, that should, you, ever, you ever see something that you, you love and it's fallen and you flinch, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like it's about to hurt? What is that? Why am I? Why am I getting a nerve response to an inanimate object? Because we like have a, a symbiotic relationship to all things. To everything. But there is. We think about our physical connection too much. Like if I'm, I'm holding on to this book, right? Mm -hmm. But whether I'm holding on to it or not, I own it. Right. Right. Whether this book is shredded in my hands, right, or somebody poured coffee on it, right? I want to be mad, not because I'm holding it, but because I own it. It's mine. Right. Right. I'm connected to it. Same, and then we got mirror nuance. We watch sports and mm -hmm. we see ourselves in things. So when somebody gets hit, it's literally, we are, we've seen ourselves get hit. Yeah. Oh, we've seen something fall that we connected to, then it feel like we've fallen, mm -hmm. right? So when we create connection to things, we create a mirror image of connection to them. So yeah. what happens to that thing, we feel it happened to us, right? right? right. That's... That's where a lot of the empathy comes from. Like we have a relationship and a connection to these things that is not physical. Right, right. Wait, real quick. Yeah. So self-regulation, um, homeostasis. You know, we spoke earlier about um, cellular regeneration and things like that. All organisms are constantly like taking an internal snapshot of what they are. And that updates itself as we process new information, as we learn. It's how we gain a sense of self-identity um, through doing this. But it's also how the body will heal if something was to happen to us, right? So if I lose, even if I get a scratch here, my body and all of the cells, they're going to communicate and use the last snapshot um, of, of how it's supposed to be and then try to recreate it. But it's pretty much imagining it and trying to recreate it as well as possible. That's why scars never look like the skin that they're replacing, 100%, but they can do the job. And um, that can be coded. Now, when you speak on mirror neurons as well, that's kind of why my mind went off to that tangent, it's that even that can be an, an, um, well, an algorithm. If you have hardware, and let's say, you know, we have a robot or an AI, and it's witnessing you go through a certain experience, um, through computer vision and, and like a lot of camera programs, I can, let's say I have a camera right here, I can map using math how this looks from your angle, right? So what we would do is route your feed, your live feed, to another bot, right? Or using whatever cameras are around. But point being that if we were to enable an AI to respond to other people's feed, quote unquote. Obviously under certain stressful situations, we can control the parameters, but point being that set it up in such a way that it does influence their behavior and their normal goals. Um, we'd get a more, I don't wanna say human, like I hate using that word, but a, a bot more in alignment with how we see ourselves. Because it, it seems like as we, as we navigate or try to pinpoint what it'll take to give AI that factor, to bring it as close to human as possible, it'll never be there. 
but to me it seems like it's a sense of self-identity. What does it think of itself? Does it, it doesn't take that internal snapshot of homo, uh, homeostasis to say, okay, well this is who I am, I know this as a database, and every experience I encounter is to either improve this in the environment, um, you know, just those factors. The conversation is kind of helping me real time outline how I'd go about programming. Uh, yeah, I think the that's a, a, a good more look at the application of utilizing artificial intelligence. You know, same way like just utilizing the computer. Period. If you're utilizing a computer for your business, it's great. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Somebody using a computer to hack into right your phone or the your MGM, business is yeah. not so great i don't like technology all of a sudden right 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 so it's it that goes with you know ai it's about the utility the use case is it mm -hmm. used to better humanity or is it used to cause issues within it right mm -hmm. there's so many different issues and problems that are arising and that will arise you know if we look at the way nigerians are using it Right, with AI for identity theft. <laughs> he, said he called them out. Like, I was just laying around. Everybody, the boy, hey, Nigeria, <laughs> leave me alone, man. Stop cloning my, my identity. Please. Your boy is no, right. but seriously, though, like, right now, people, you can, you can utilize the voice cloning and you can create an avatar and that voice clone can run a. Um, it can it can run a meeting for you on Zoom, right. and people may not know for a while. If it gets so good, right, they may never figure it out. I brought GPT, uh, you know, put GPT four with the voice clone, having it handle the responses. Uh, a lot of people probably wouldn't. I, right. My voice clone could have fooled me not long ago. Like That's what I, was, I was saying, I was like, what? And so. it, it can fool the bank, credit card companies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. People are using AI to literally send texts. So they can yeah, automate yeah, yeah. texts to <laughs> help establish relationships with people, a clientele, emails, um, create blogs to the point where sites have to say this is AI based. I'm seeing news threads already that saying this is AI mm. so that they got news articles that are completely written by AI by, yeah. you know, scanning the Internet, probably going to Google, looking at the latest news and saying, hey, write this in. I was I probably the voice. first person to do that. Yeah. yeah. When I was trying to do the AI newspaper, well, I built it as an algorithm, but after a while I assessed it, I was like, that's corny. I don't even want it no more, but. No, I think, it, it, I think it, it's not it, corny. I think, it's, I think it's intelligent. It would have to be purposed properly for, like, you know, what we were saying earlier, the media um, and what we want to portray in it, what we want to teach in mm -hmm. the media. If it was curated in such a way that it was you know, strategic, then definitely. Peace, family. Education is, of course, important to me. That's what High Level Conversations is, is edutainment, right? You sit here and you get to learn. But it's also important to be able to talk to the educators, right? So if you go to 19keys.com, you can check out my schedule, and you're going to see that I'll be in New York at Teach Jam speaking to the educators. I would love for you all to show up, support it. I love being able to travel around and educate and teach. So anytime I get one of these bookings, I take it very serious and I'm ready to show up and give the proper thought leadership that's needed to take us to where we want to be. And that's from our current level to our highest level. Make sure you go to 19keys.com, 19 check the schedule, support the mission, get your merch, check all of the dates for our tours, anything we got going on, it is all there on site. Peace. But back to the point though, like there are all these systems, right, that for mental health, everybody can have a personalized therapist, mm -hmm. right? Whether, you, you know, I, it, it seems very like oh, just get a human or just do the human thing. Mm -hmm. We already in that phase. Yeah. And that's not working. It's not, not working. So what I'm saying is, I'm not saying use it. Mm -hmm. I'm just giving you what some positive use cases could be because we're in a phase where the mental health decline, low education is already bad, right? right? If we have these tools, how can we effectively use them and build in a manner to where it makes our movement, our revolution, our progress more efficient? Mm -hmm. Right, you are a coder, right? Mm -hmm. a technologist and an engineer of sorts. You can build bots, you can clone bots, you understand technology, and there's goods and there are dangers, mm -hmm. right? 
the average person, you know, I think security is a huge thing that we don't think about a lot, mm -hmm. right? We see um, hackers hacking, uh, whether it's, it was crypto wallets, they have been whole casinos now holding it for <laughs> ransom. And I believe that, you know, when quantum computers come online, security threat is the biggest issue because mm -hmm. then nobody's nothing is safe. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Because these computers, right, can operate like superhumans. Yeah, yeah. And there, there, there are no like cold resistant things. You know what I'm saying? So that everybody, we, we see it all the time. And we don't think about it. Data breach, <laughs> data wild. breach, yeah. data breach. We get emails about it. Equifax, T-Mobile. Right. Right. All I never these, cared either. You, you are know, part of life. all these data breaches. Back in the day, yeah, that would have shocked you. Like, what? You'd have been tripping. Now. <laughs> Every we give our data away so much, but I want you to speak towards number one. How do we? What are some things that people don't know about, like when it comes to security risk and like hacking? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are some of the safeguards a person can do? You know, to try to be more um, secure and protected. Yeah. So, uh, so I personally, if I go out. I don't use Wi-Fi, you know. Um, if it's a why not? So check this out. I can set up a man in the middle kind of attack where me and you are at Starbucks. I can name my hotspot Starbucks Wi-Fi, right? And when you connect, I'm getting an IP, you know, a call from your device connecting to mine, and by way of like, I can see your, all of your local data, so everything in your phone, essentially, because to make a connection to the internet, you need to kind of run your own server. And communication is always two-way, simply put, if you, you know. So, but yeah, I can name my hotspot, Starbucks, you connect to mine, boom, I can see everything on your phone. So what um, kind of data does that give you? Uh, all your files, it can be your passwords, your notes, your pictures. Um, it, it comes up in something we call JSON format in a bunch of dictionaries. But pretty much the entire directory of your phone um, in folder mode for every application, all of those things. Unless the app itself is encrypted, any of the, the information that's funneling through is, is pretty much vulnerable. Um, that's one. Another is on, on the crypto side of thing. I uh, I built an app called Key Genie for the Key Gen. It was Key Generator, but it generates cold keys that don't get stored, right? So MetaMask, all of these. Um, what is what would you call Meta? MetaMask. They're not a wallet themselves. What is it? What is it? They're just a, they're like a protocol. Or, it's a wallet. Okay, yeah, so it's a wallet. I think they got a token now. Right. right, coming out with one, but it's a while. Yeah, so, okay. Point being, though, for like them to store almost. your keys, they have to have your information. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, like, you can go in there and you can type your password. Let's say my, my password is solar or whatever. And what that does is they'll take my username, they'll make sure the, the, my password matches, and then they'll query their own database for my private key. But point being is my private key has to be in their database mm -hmm. for them to connect my fake password to that password. Mm -hmm. And then it triggers it. So, meaning I, you know, most people don't even know their private key, but it's MetaMask does. So anybody who can attack their system or, or can segue right. into that can see all of the information. Um, so I use my, my own keys. You know, I log in manually every time. Um, a, few, a few of those, but... Other than that, it's it's nothing that you can really protect. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, like you said, the the biggest vulnerabilities we expose ourselves to, we'll, for, by signing up to applications and stuff like that. Um, the in the financial sector, I think. So here's another thing. You know how they they say don't click on weird links and stuff like that, emails, um, whether it's in a text message. That's because. When I build a program, I can make any button do anything. That's the difference between the front-end development and the back-end development. The front-end development is how it looks. It's a button, but on the back-end, I'm building an algorithm that says this button does this. Now, I can make a button look like it says apply now. 
or join or sign up to something or just click this link. But really what it's doing is it's triggering another function, right? Um, the reason hackers work like that is this link is on your computer. When you click it, you're giving me permission. But that algorithm can be saying, oh, open up root folder. Open up this file or extract information from here, X, Y, Z. So uh, it's the most blatantly obvious, but I still encounter people who click on these random links. I still get um, DMs from people on Instagram who were hacked. You know what I mean? And I'm like, you know, I, I didn't know people still click on <laughs> click on those links. Mm -hmm. So, but those are those are the most prominent. Like, so those are like phishing attacks. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, those are very prominent in the, the crypto world. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Those phishing attacks where they create the sites. A lot of times you can just look at the email and see there's some fake. They got some generic email. And I was like, what the hell is this? It's not from the actual site. In the yeah, place. yeah, yeah. But it's like it's getting increasingly more dangerous every single day, especially with new technology. You're ignorant to things. And right. the horror stories don't get out, so you don't think about protecting yourself. You're mm -hmm. kind of naive, right? And... Just not only that, I mean, like I said, it's a dangerous world. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? So we go out and we do a lot of things. We use technology for so many different things, Everything. right? I would just say don't, number one, sensitive information, and it's hard to say don't store it on the phone because yeah. that's kind of what we got the phone for. In the first place. <laughs> but, you know, it's like there's no such thing as like safety when it no. comes to technology. Right. Security is mortal's worst enemy. That's what yeah. Shakespeare said. You never say. John McAfee <laughs> used to talk about how, you know, it's very easy to hack into an iPhone. Mm -hmm. Right. And of course they have, you know, they work with, you know, any agency <laughs> that they want to, to be able to hack into any phone in mm -hmm. case that they need to, to get and extract whatever information off of it at any point in time. Yeah. So, you know, Writing stuff down is still key. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, some people use Faraday um, technique, mm -hmm. right, where, you know, you basically create this box to where no signals can come in or out, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, you know, they have those things that they sell that you can put your phone in if yeah. you want to, right, yeah. to kind of like go off grid if that's something that you wanted to do. Um, but it's like in an increase in technological world, these are the things you have to think about the most, mm -hmm. right? You can we encounter people all the time who have skill sets that you may not realize, right? And unless you're thinking about these things, then you don't have any protection at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes for everybody, yeah, right? Yeah. In every single person in the world, more things are on servers to any other point in time in history, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? Um, and then there are some creative techniques that we don't even know to foresee, mm -hmm. right? And that goes to the point of, you know, yeah, just try to limit as much as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, the things that you put on the phones, the things that you send, you know, sending people pictures it's said to be a no-no because there's metadata within that. All, the, yeah, your location. all your location is Everything, in that. Yeah. And there's sites that they can upload that picture, get all of that information. See when it was taken, where. So it's like yeah. these are practices of safety. And I definitely want to come back again and have a longer conversation about this because I think it really deserves its own conversation. But the AI, right? We, yeah. Uh, yeah, 100%. Man. Because, 100%. I mean, we, shoot, there's people out here that, that may not realize, like, this is how a person found me. This is how a person stalked yeah. me. This is how a person got me. And you might not be thinking about the tech side, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Or you might not be thinking about that Wi-Fi that you tapped into, right? right? Free Wi-Fi, never free. I guess that's kind of the whole point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And your phone tries to tell you sometimes, like, nope, don't, don't log into <laughs> yeah, no Wi-Fi in this area because I can't protect you. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's set up with these alerts for a reason mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> because it's very real. There's a whole dark world beyond the world that you see. Mm -hmm. Right. In every technology, in every case, there's always a world that's veiled. Mm -hmm. Right. And that world is where one that you're the most unprotected. Right. It's the most unsuspecting world ever. Right. Well, the last 30 years, you know, the gap between what programmers knew and the general public who relied on the Internet every day was just so huge. I'd say until like what the last until the social media booms. 
I'd say people really didn't care about what a programmer could do. You know what I mean? It took those Facebooks and these tech giants, these Amazons kind of to come through for people like, wait, coding, uh, you know? So, but, but prior to that, the people who were developing these systems, we call them black hat and white hat hackers, you know, the, the white hat, they're, they're good guys. They're people who know how to hack and they build systems for prevention. But for the longest time, this, that war was going on forever because let's say I wanted to exploit a system because it, it benefited me. But at some point, I wanted to build, you know, I level up, I build my own company and now I have to kind of protect against the systems that I used to use. Um, but now that there's a, a greater social awareness of technology and how these, uh, how these softwares are working, um, there's a lot more white ha hackers and people doing a lot more to make sure that you can't really use the same brute force coding techniques, um, blockchain being one of them. With its vulnerabilities, it's still, it's impenetrable if, if everything was code wallet. You know what I mean? If we all remembered our private and public keys. Um, but for the longest time, the biggest villains were usually the same people working at the companies. You know what I mean? If I design something for a bank and I notice that the whole bank has no idea about these systems, because most of the time when I'm talking to people, they have no idea what's, what's going on. I spend more time educating clients than I feel like I do working on the projects for them. So um, when you, and you look at the, the history of these people who are doing crazy time for hacking, and um, which usually the FBI will come get you and try to hire you because the hackers were so far ahead of the government. They, they didn't know how to deal with it. Um, but it, yeah, like I said, it was usually an employees of these huge companies, the same people building the systems for them who would later either turn around and try to extort them, or they would leave some vulnerabilities or back doors in there so that they can exploit later and just funnel money to themselves. Mm. <laughs> That's deep. Oh, so people, protect yourself out there. Man, times. first of all, I want to thank you for being coming on High Level Conversations. Hey, we man. definitely got more conversations to have. And I'm blessed to be here, brother. We are living Bro. in the evolution of the digital world. Um, there are a lot of things that we should think about as the world continues to advance and the world continues to move, right? Questions that we may don't feel like we have the time to pose, conversations that we probably won't have in our household. It's why we're having them here, because the very nature of reality depends on it. The very nature of reality is being decided by people who do have these conversations, right? I can think of a million ways to implement AI within your business, to consult you about it, to come up with creative ideas. But that's because I spend the time thinking about it, right? The average person doesn't spend the time thinking about how do I control my future? What impact can I have on it? What influence can I have on it? I'm mm -hmm. always thinking like that, right? And that's why I'm always studying these subjects. And that's why I like bringing them to the forefront. These things will affect all communities. It's going to affect you whether you think about it or whether you don't think about it, right? But you realizing the power that you have to adjust reality by just thinking about it, by adding into the conversation. How can you vote for something that you're ignorant of? So this is why certain regulation has to be left up to the people who actually think about the problem, right? Because mm -hmm. everybody else, they're part of the problem because they're ignorant of it. So they would allow it to continue to go, continue to go until it becomes so unimaginable or uh, uh, unmanageable right that the problem right is unimaginable <laughs> so here we are at this frontier right of educating each other educate yourself on ai put in the ten thousand hours right if you want to tap in with us of course we have education that you can tap in you can learn whether it's through the workshops whether you learn to implement ai within your business whether you do media whether you need it through emails whether you need it to create more efficiency whether you're doing images video music right whether you're writing speeches whatever it may be Anything. right this technology can be used and now you have a resource Right, so make sure you come tap in, but make sure at the same time, have these conversations, think about the future, have control over it, and stay high level. I'm 19 Keys. Keep yourself safe. Peace. Peace. I've always been a very multifaceted person. Uh, I, I grew up in an area, it's called Newburgh, New York, where 
some people call it the sixth borough, but the city is right next to the suburbs. Pretty much the suburbs border the city and, and in the center, it's just a war zone. And outside, it's peaceful, it's quiet. My parents were divorced, so I had to pretty much travel between both uh, growing up. And I feel like that gave me just a perspective that a lot of people didn't have. I saw, saw both sides of the coin. So, you know, I was the, the guy in the hood with my guitar and boxing gloves. You know, I was rapping and listening to rock. It was, it was all around me. And, you know, I definitely experienced a lot of the, oh, he, he's different. But it was never, it was never in a, uh, in a, what's the word I'm looking for? Derogatory way. Um, it was always in a, we kind of don't understand them. It's just some weird, we're not even going to try to learn it. So, you know, it, it led to me being not interested in most people and doing my own thing which helped me cultivate my own skills. Uh, most of my life I was a musician, so I spent a lot of time uh, teaching myself instruments, uh, reading a lot. So I've always been into knowledge, um, the intelligentsia. And my mother also was a, a driving force behind that because in my house you couldn't use words that you couldn't spell. You know, So you get popped in the mouth for that and then you had to go study until you could spell the word. So a number of factors helped me uh, cultivate a, a strong mind and an applicable mind and in adulthood you know, it wasn't until two years ago when I decided to take on programming and artificial intelligence realistically I had always told myself if music didn't work out I just go build robots and that was kind of a, a joke I had for myself uh, growing up I, like I said I was fascinated with technology um, a bunch of sci-fi but I definitely felt like it was out of reach um, I, I didn't work hard enough in high school to get the full ride to college and my, my parents made so much, so many comments often about how expensive college was. I didn't even want to go, right? So I, I went on to pursue music and I did very well in music for years, but at some point I, um, I sat by myself and I just said, how many more producers do we need? How many rappers do we need? And I, I feel like I'm one of the best in the world. However, to just be of service to our people and to, to be productive, I wanted to uh, fill a void. And I noticed that on, in the tech sector and programming, there's just, there's none of us. In AI, there's less than 1% of us in, uh, you know, globally. So I, I dove head first. I cut out all of the distractions, all of the Netflix, all of the TV, anything that wasn't, um, feeding my desire to learn and actually satiating it. So the shows that I did watch had to do with programming. Um, and, you know, I, I remember thinking to myself that a season on Netflix is the equivalent to a college course. So just making those adjustments in my mind uh, and changing my perspective, I, I just buckled down and dove into tech and here we are. You know? Man, first of all, everybody needs a CTO. Everybody needs somebody in the technological field. Um, everybody needs somebody that can do AI programming, um, somebody that can handle coding and background stuff for you. Everybody needs somebody that can just add in, you know, um, automation to your business, right? Just for, you know, efficiencies and other things of that nature. You know, you really want somebody who knows what they're doing. I like being around people smarter than me. I think it comes down that simple. Um, and specifically in things that they're good at, right? I'm not gonna sit there and argue with this brother about coding. I don't know it. If I did, then I would. <laughs> but I can't do that. And so there's, I am a person that has a lot of ideas and I have really good ideas. And so they go to waste if we can't implement that. You know what I'm saying? So having people that have the expertise to help bring ideas into reality is the dream within itself. Right. So, you know, I'm always surrounded by people that do really dope things. Um, and so, yeah, this was, you know, me just me introducing you to somebody that I know that's usually in the background, bringing them to the forefront. And, you know, it wasn't just a conversation, of course, about, you know, coding, um, but more so, you know, about the thought processes, the philosophical nature of things as well. I think a lot of times we just have to get into the point of like thinking, the art of thinking itself. It changes the way we go about doing things, changes the way we live. 
when you have a way of thinking about everything and sometimes we don't dive deep into like one long stream of thought right and this stops us from really building from a deep-rooted place because most of our thought processes are shallow and they just mimic the world around us that tell us what to think. So we become very reactionary and very passive about what influences us and the actions that we take based on those influences. So growing up, I, I love reading different philosophers and how they engage thought and went deep on it because I believe that's the whole point of having a brain and having this thought process in the first place. And from there, you can truly draw out new realities. From there, you, you draw out a completely different way of going about your world. This world is built on very deep philosophies, books and books and books and books on ideas about love and war and emotions and technology and spirituality and, you know, the nature of the mind and, you know, science and psychology and all of these different things, society. And so you, if you want to see a better world, how about we think about a better world? How about we go as deep as the people who built the world that we live in so that when it's time for us to build our own world, we have a deep rooted consciousness about the foundation that we're building on. It's funny because when I wanted to, to learn how to program, I immediately looked up what would be the most profitable things in the next few years. It was blockchain and artificial intelligence. So. I learned how to build a blockchain from scratch. I wasn't even interested on how to interact with them, all of the dApp stuff that everybody was into. I wanted to know how they worked and functioned in and out so that I can build them and offer uh, private chains to companies. And same with artificial intelligence. I knew, this was two years ago, I knew that every company would sue and have a, a chatbot. This is when you know, you go on GoDaddy, they have one. A lot of sites had them, but they were rule-based chatbots, meaning the responses are pre-programmed. Um, so I, that, that was my plan. I, I projected that if I can get enough corporate clients um, and handle some maintenance, I'd be good. I still undervalued myself, uh, you know, immediately jumping in, go through that. I went through that imposter syndrome, not knowing how qualified I was for a given task. and. I guess those feelings made me overcompensate. I studied harder, I studied harder, and I got to a level that, you know, before I knew it, I was better than most programmers and engineers, and I'd go to hire people who were fresh out of university, and I knew more about the infrastructures of applications than they did. I knew how algorithms work more than they did. So I realized that I was good enough to, I should be leading teams, I should have more resources, uh, but I still had no objective uh, assessment of what my work was worth. Obviously, clients are not going to tell you. So you know, I, I just stayed consistent. I kept posting uh, my, my projects. I entered a few hackathons um, with OpenAI, Anthropic AI, made a name for myself with both companies and established a very good relationship with OpenAI. Uh, I sent them a number of model contributions for GPT Neo about a year and a half ago, which were later integrated into GPT 3.5. And this was before OpenAI even had a website that you could use and go talk to their chatbots. Um, so I was able to leverage that as a, as a nice resume, um, resume staple there to take to other companies. And most recently, I had a client that had wanted me to integrate AI into a system, and I told him that I was using one of my models where, as he thought that we'd be integrating a third-party solution like OpenAI or GPT, and when he heard about my plans for my company and the model, and that I had a number of them, he asked how much it would cost to, to get the model. So um, I sold it for $1.3 million. We did the assessment by gauging how much equity I'd get in the platform that I'm building for them. So I'm also getting equity in the platform. And that has allowed me to expand a little bit, open up my own space and, you know, oversee teams. But again, it, I, I can't emphasize enough how much it really, it, it comes from. The difference between me and these other developers, it's, it's those small things in the mind. I, I didn't see no other alternative. Um, you know, me and Keys, we spoke on belief, 
before I knew that I was, or how I was going to be successful, I told myself I would be. I told myself exactly how much I'd make and I lived it. I, uh, I made sure that I was that X factor to fit that reality. And just by staying consistent, delivering on projects, over delivering, and staying on top of my craft, becoming, I, I consider myself a standard, if not the standard for independent developers. Um, and yes, I'm just blessed. Uh, the vision for 19 Keys AI is to be able to duplicate myself, um, to do number one task work for me digitally, um, but also, you know, for 19 Keys Consultancy, right? Because I can program a lot of my framework on how I think and how I go about, you know, building and doing things into the AI system. And I can't always give people access to me, but I can give them access to the AI, right? So in with it being specifically customized and built based on, you know, my way of thinking and my way of doing things, it'll be, you know, the next best thing talking to me, right? So, you know, we might have to attach an uh, avatar to that, but it's like Google. Just think of like Google, but uh, at 19 keys Google. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, you're going to ask it questions and it's going to answer based on the parameters that I would give it. And so therefore you're getting that 19 keys, you know, um, thought process. So it's like, you know, having a thought leader in your pocket. I, I think in two months, a person could be a, a basic coder and that's like what's general programming, understanding how it works, and um, you know, everything else after that would be self-study. I'm big on teaching people how to learn. You know, and I feel uh, that's, that's the job school failed. But the, the things that you need to know to become a programmer, and this is my, this is the way I outline it, is first I teach a variable. What is a variable? Well, this equals this, All right? Uh, my name is a variable, right? So just defining things, because when you build a program, everything needs a name and needs to be defined, because when you reference it, you need to call it something, right? So giving everything a name, that's step one. Understanding how operators work. Operators are just math. So uh, most coding software has calculators built into it because um, all computers are calculators, essentially. But understanding how to perform mathematic calculations by way of program, what these formulas look like, where do I need to put certain parentheses to do division versus multiplication, etc. After I teach those basic things, I teach data structures, how to store information. Um, your username and passwords, when you go into a, uh, a website, that's stored somewhere. Your Instagram comments, your DMs, that's all stored somewhere and they exist in these data structures that, that are a must know for programming. And then after that, I get into if then statements, um, writing actual algorithms. If this happens, then do this. But that's all predicated on what? The variables we name. So if something happens to this variable, um, perform this mathematic calculation. Now we have an algorithm. And for there, from there, people are on their way to becoming developers. Yeah, I would say one of the main focuses should be the art of prompting. Um, prompting within itself is basically a command to get a response out of whatever particular software program you're working. So if it's ChatGPT and I wanted to write a book, it's going to say, okay, what kind of book, right? And the prompt may say, okay, well, write me a book about the science fiction about an alien that falls in love with a human and that no longer wants to destroy Earth. But it's going to need more context. So now it's going to say, OK, I need you to write it like a particular author. I need you to write it like it was in the 18th century with old English. So now or write it like Shakespeare would write it so that it's more poetic or I can give it specifics about demographics that I wanted to uh, write for. So the, write it for the ages of people between 18 and 35. So now it's going to go back to the drawing board and then rewrite it. And, you know, prompting is really at the same time the art of or art of getting the most out of AI efficiently. Right. Because it's not just from a tech standpoint. There's 
there's text to music, there's text to video, right? And unless you know different, like, like you know different styles when it comes to video, right? Whether it's different filters, different directors, different lenses, all of that can be used in the prompt so that you get out a particular style. A person may have an idea in their head, but they can't describe what's in their head because they have no experience on the mechanics that's required to bring that to life. So being able to describe that in detail allows you to be able to utilize these programs in a way to be efficient. So know that AI doesn't replace the job because it creates a new job, which is the person that needs to use the AI, which is, you know, creating efficiencies. So it's like for me, prompting is like one of the number one things. If you can teach these children how to use the technology, they can get the most out of it. How do they go about doing research? How do they go about utilizing data? Right. How do they go about, you know, utilizing, you know, Zapier to connect plugins, right, that connects all your websites together so that they can work congruent with each other. Right. So if I tell ChatGPT, I want you to run a blog. Right. And I connect that ChatGPT to Shopify through a Zapier. Right. And y'all can learn about that, you know, through, you know, BWO if you want to or you know, AI things that we got going on, then it can automatically connect it and run that for me. But these are things that you may not know about. I was talking to a brother, he was sitting there doing a, he, he was taking, I was in New York and he was busy for like days because he said he was preparing this report. And I'm like, man, why don't you just ask me? I could have showed you some different tools that you could have used that probably could have cut down that time by like, by a third, right? You could have been done probably within hours, but he's doing things the old fashioned way. And that to me, you know, is an issue because now I can't connect with bruh and he can't get it fast. So now we can't get that time to be able to connect and have his meeting because all your time is now being, you know, dried up doing one task. When we are in 2023 and there's tools to help you get that task done in a much more effective way. So, you know, teaching these students prompting allows them to be able to go into different places and have a value. Right. Whether you're a photographer and you learn how to get better effects out your pictures. Right. Because you just shot it at a wedding and you learn how to use the AI to help you do some editing or background recreation or whatever it may be. Or whether you are a CAD designer or and, and or you could just not be a designer at all. But, you know, prompting and you say, hey, if you just draw me out a sketch of your idea, then I'm going to come up with an industrial design for it that will be ready to go take to a engineer or um you know production so that's a, a, an assistance or help that a person can utilize like there's so many different ways and so i think that what colleges are doing in high schools where they're trying to ban chat gpt they're doing the opposite for those students right because we are we're in a world where they should be teaching them how to use it right there's teaching them how to use their mind yes but then it's teaching them skills that may be outdated for what their future would be, that may be very valuable for your present and your past, but not their future. So you're grading them on the wrong criteria of what's value in the first place. So, you know, we also want to put out a textbook um, that teaches these things as well so that you can sort of have like a comprehensive outline. So. If people want to tap into that, of course, make sure y'all text the number that's at the bottom of the screen, you know, text AI. Um, and we have make sure that, you know, you learn how to implement AI in your daily life and your business um, within developing skills, whether at the same time you want to learn coding, things of that nature is here, it's available. And we want to make sure that nobody, you know, um, is without the power to utilize the technology of today. I'm 19 Keys and this is High Level Conversation. Tap in with the guy. Peace family, human here. We love to reward the quest for knowledge, so we have something special for you. We are giving away a free computer and also a programming course. All you have to do is go to High Level Conversations, the audio, subscribe, give it five stars, leave a like and a comment, and uh, you'll be eligible to be entered into a raffle. And you'll hear from us soon. New records, new history can be created. But what does that matter if you're not educated and you're consistently distracted? They said because of social media, this new technology, it has actually made people more distracted and less focused. So therefore, they said the average person can only focus somewhere around 7 to 10 seconds. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Come and join the Block World Order.